everyone. Uh, Tuesday, July 5th, 6 p.m., uh, Enfield Town Council special meeting. Sheila Roll Call. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Here. Mayor Crisati. Here. Councillor Despard. Absent. Councillor Finger. Here. Councillor Hopkins. Here. Councillor Ludwick. Here. Councillor Mangini. Here. Councillor Pisner. Here. Councillor Santanella. Councillor Ungeyer. Here. Nine members present and one <coughs> absent. Okay, thank you. Um, next on the agenda, discussion on the retention of an independent review of the reevaluation issues. And I will direct that to my Matt. Uh, <coughs> Attorney Talbert, please. Yes, uh, you thank you. Update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the council and uh, members of the public. At the uh, June 20 council meeting, uh, I outlined the process that was undertaken by our office, which resulted in our recommendation that the town retain the firm of Bircham Moses to conduct the review, an independent review of the revaluation issues. I won't repeat what was said uh, at the last meeting, but it's worth noting a few things regarding the uh, revaluation process and what I propose as your town attorney. One, uh, we're not proposing a or an investigation, uh, but rather a review of the issues surrounding the revaluation process. And I say that because uh, to call it an investigation suggests that there is some misconduct or malfeasance. We have seen no credible evidence to suggest there was any misconduct or malfeasance by anyone. Let me also start with the uh, general observation that almost all tax appeals resolved in Connecticut in the Superior Court, ones that reach court, which is the next step after the Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, are resolved amicably uh, by way of mediation. And you may recall, as your town attorney, over the past few years, I've come to you and we've presented in an executive session a number of proposed settlements and they get resolved. That's because in the Judicial District of Hartford, where the tax appeals from Enfield are adjudicated, um, there has been a presiding judge there that for, uh, for quite a long time encourages strongly parties to resolve tax appeals. Some would say, uh, the more cynical ones, would say that he forces parties to settle and will not allow cases to be tried. Um, because uh, these disputes are resolved, for the most part, without a trial, and that should be undisputed, you can check the stats, there are very few cases that actually go to a trial where a fact finder would make determinations and issue findings. Because there are few cases that are tried, you have fewer appeals to the appellate court. Because you have fewer appeals to the appellate court, there is scant, and by that I mean not much, legal authority at the Connecticut Supreme Court regarding tax appeals. The end result of that is there's a, uh, a marked lack of guidance for property owners on the one hand and tax assessors on the other side. And in our adversary process, what you have is either side arguing the, uh, making the arguments that advantage their side. <clears throat> That leaves the tax assessor with broad discretion and you end up with, around the state, disparities. Uh, it depends on uh, the particular circumstances in a town um, and, and you don't see a lack of uniformity. Uh, and that, that is, I'm talking about reviews of the dizzying array of statutes, including PA 490, which governs uh, forestry, open space, and farms. Um, so Enfield is not alone in this regard. And um, when there are disputes on the local level, the Board of Assessment Appeals has, they are in effect a mini appellate review board of the uh, decisions of the tax assessor. There is a built-in tension between uh, those two sides. My impression, um, having seen it from uh, uh, the sidelines, is that there's that natural tension that somehow has just gotten personal, and, and it's unfortunate. And so my recommendation to you a couple of weeks ago, which I'll reiterate here tonight, is that we all please just take a step back. Let somebody with subject matter expertise on these issues, who is a noted authority on them, take over and do the review. Somebody who can review the issues, make factual findings, complete a report, hopefully that would be publicly available, 
and make recommendations for how can the town of Enfield do this better going forward. That is the goal. I have some good news. The silver lining in all of this, as we sit here today, is the town of Enfield, through our uh, clerk and through the town attorney's office, we've only received six tax appeals that were filed to the Superior Court. And I think the window is just about closed. I'm not sure if we're going to see any more. I'm aware of other peer municipalities, quite similar to Enfield, where one town already has 56 tax appeals that have been filed in court. I think I've mentioned to some of you, um, many municipalities are expecting an onslaught. And this other municipality didn't RFP need to bring on additional lawyers to handle the expected influx because, as we all know, property values have increased during COVID on the uh, residential side. Um, and so that's the, that's the silver lining. Now, why are there so few tax appeals filed in the Connecticut Superior Court regarding Enfield? Well, one possible explanation is that the vast majority of taxpayers receive the relief that they requested from the BAA, and they don't have to go to court. Uh, or the vast majority of the taxpayers, while they may have had complaints, don't have complaints significant enough to require them to get a lawyer and go to court. Again, we have six tax appeals, so let's look on the bright side. Um, let me shift to one topic. You all received something from the BAA today, the minutes. There was a meeting on Saturday, and I did, in fact, take time out of my holiday weekend to attend. And let me tell you why. Throughout this entire time where we've had issues and People have come to the council and presented grievances. I've not ever once been consulted by the BAA. They never reached out to me or sought my legal advice. As your town attorney, I'm not in the business of injecting myself unless I'm asked. I get we get requested to do opinions or to answer questions all the time from boards and from all different directions. But in my experience, having practiced uh, for 26 years, I've found that the easiest way to resolve a dispute is you go to a person, you look them in the eye, you shake their hand, and you talk about it. And so I went there Saturday to the BAA meeting, expecting that I would just talk to them and try to find some common ground. But at the BAA meeting, the chair announced that he had hired a lawyer to represent the BAA. And that closed the door to me. Once uh, a, a person or an entity has a lawyer, I'm, I'm prohibited by the rules of professional conduct. I can't have that discussion. So I sat silently and watched the meeting. I am confused by the BA's hiring of legal counsel. I mean, tonight we have a resolution. It's the second time up where you all will debate and consider. Um, and there have been a lot of questions about the process. And some of you, in fact, were able to interview uh, the, the candidate. I'm not aware of the BAA doing any um, similar bid waiver, or I'm not sure about the scope of their search to find a lawyer. Um, I'm not sure how, it, I, if, Mr. if the chair wants to pay, uh, the chair of the BAA is going to pay for that lawyer. That's one thing. But um, we have to do a bid waiver for the lawyer that we propose be retained. So I'm not sure about the funding for that. That's for another day. Um, you will recall when we did the new counselor training earlier this year, one of the basic tenets of municipal law that I counseled you on was that um, municipalities, being a creature of statute, uh, they, they have limited powers, rather. And those powers of a municipality are limited and granted to the municipality by statute. Well, the BAA, being a much smaller public agency than the town itself, uh, pursuant to general statutes 12-110, has very limited statutory authority. Only limited powers specifically delegated to it by the state. They're empowered to hear appeals in September and in March. Now, those dates often get extended, so this year I guess they went longer than that. But my understanding is that the BAA has finished its task. They've discharged their duty. They've heard all the appeals. So again, it's a head scratcher why there would be a lawyer hired by the BAA. We certainly don't want to be adverse to the BAA, so I, I don't know why, um, why uh, there's the lawyer. But in any event, um, with respect, the, the board also, the BAA, passed a couple of motions directing the council what it thinks the council should or should not do with regard to these issues. With respect, the charter grants the authority to the town attorney to be the legal advisor to your council. Um, I take my job very seriously, and with respect, it's within my role as the charter to make recommendations to you about how this 
should proceed. So in closing, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and um, reasonable minds can disagree, especially when the issues involve taxes, which is an emotional issue in a person's home. But these disputes must be resolved in a professional and thoughtful manner with proper regard for the interest of all concerns. Our legal system is premised on that adversary process. There are, there's bound to be some disagreement and tension, but when all is said and done, the truth will be re revealed. And um, with that background, I'm happy to answer any questions, and then I, I hope tonight you will approve uh, the recommendation to hire the firm of Birch and Moses to do an independent review. And that's, uh, that's all I have. Uh, Council Councilor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think, firstly, uh, for me at least, uh, a lot of questions have been raised about the assessment process. Um, I think what's discussed here wouldn't answer those questions. I think doing just a, a superficial review of assessments is going to, you know, is not going to answer these questions specifically. Um, the council is, is in, empowered under Section 8 of the Charter to investigate any concerns about departments, and I think it's important for the council to honor that duty, um, you know, especially if we're going to take the time to hire an outside law firm. I think we should make sure that we're getting our money's worth there. So all the questions that, you know, out there nebulously need to be addressed. Um, I would have preferred to meet um, last week. I did request a special meeting to discuss this um, so that we can move this along in an efficient way. Uh, and I think the first step is to understand the questions and to be giving questions to a law firm to answer. Um, I think it's going to be difficult for a law firm to look at this and even understand what we want them to do. Um, the, the resolution put forward at the last meeting says the council wishes to have an independent review conducted regarding various issues concerning the town's recent reevaluation process. So if we were just to give that to a law firm, I would be a little concerned about what, what, what are they going to do with that. Now, if the answer is, um, you know, the town attorney could kind of clean that up after the fact and ask specific questions, um, I, th I would have a couple concerns with that because that kind of defeats the whole purpose of having an independent review. Um, and the same for if the town manager's office were to develop those questions as well, uh, because we have a situation here where, um, you know, the department that people have, have claimed issue with is supervised by the town manager. So we're running into conflict of interest situations here that could uh, take away some of the legitimacy of this. So I think it's really important that the council and its charter uh, bound authority develop those questions and give those to the law firm so we can get specific answers and to put this whole thing uh, to rest. So I suggest that we discuss some of that today um, so that we can move that ball forward in determining what questions we want the law firm to ask or else it's really, you know, uh, the law firm is trying to find a needle in the haystack without even understanding what the, what needle we're looking for. So thank you. May I, may I respond to that through the yeah. mayor? <clears throat> Attorney Talberg. Yeah, um, so the proposed initial task for the law firm, um, uh, in order for the lawyer to do a conflict check, I sent him all of the core material, meaning there were uh, two reports the BAA issued that outlined their concerns, uh, uh, and there were a, a number of other documents um, related to that. That's simply to, to let the lawyer understand, well, here's the initial scope of the assignment, which obviously the client would direct what other uh, specific areas you wanted or the client wanted to be reviewed. So, Councilor Hopkins, if you had specific thoughts or questions, obviously there's a way where that could be accommodated and that could be um, directed to the, to the firm uh, to address your concern. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you very much. Just one additional follow-up. Um, I think it would be important to have these things in writing um, for the council to approve and add any questions people want to ask, um, you know, before we hire that firm, just to make sure that's very clear uh, and there's no question. Because, you know, concerns have been raised. It's important that we follow our duty to make sure that those are figured out. Um, so I appreciate that. I have spent some, some time listening to all of the questions that are raised in prior meetings, as well as what people have brought me um, as through constituents. I have prepared a list that I will give to everybody, just if they'd like to, to look at that, um, and perhaps others agree with those questions. I think it'd be entirely uh, not only appropriate, but necessary that you do that. And, and any other counselor who wish to be heard on that should have that opportunity. Uh, Councillor <coughs> Councillor Ungeyer. 
uh, through the mayor to the town attorney and the town manager. Good evening. Um, in our last meeting on June 20th, uh, you stated that there's no connection or association with you, um, your, your whole entire dais, anyone, to your recommendation of Bertram Moses. Can you again confirm now that there's no connection and no association with this particular law firm? Um, Council Unger, I, I'm happy to answer that question. I'm not sure the exact language uh, that I used, um, but what I can tell you is that the attorney was given a list of the names of the uh, main uh, uh, participants, and the town is being as the client and responded that he uh, has no conflicts, that he is conflict-free. There were a number of other law firms we looked at that in, in the classic sense, uh, we lawyers look at a conflict of, um, have you represented this party before on uh, a similar matter or this matter? Or um, uh, you know, there, there are a variety of factors that a lawyer would consider when uh, determining whether there's a conflict or not. And um, the lawyer responded that he has no conflicts. Thank you. Councilor Pisner. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Um, and I did take the opportunity to interview uh, Attorney Coppola. But as I have said, um, I went online and found some information that does look like, in all fairness, he has worked with some of you. Um, so I'm going to question again. There is a case from the city of Bristol um, for the Inlands Wetlands, and that would have been at the time when our current town manager was the mayor. Um, maybe I'm assuming incorrectly, but I would assume as a mayor, you would be hiring an, a law firm. No, may, may, I, may I respond? I don't want to cut you off. Is there, is there more to the question? Or? Well, I've got a couple other things. Okay. So may I respond to that? Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes. <clears throat> There's a case. I don't want to say the case name. Uh, it arose from an inland wetlands issue, and the attorney responded to that. And I think he shrugged and said um, uh, there might have been a wetlands case. Attorney Coppola works out of the Westport office of that firm. Um, there's a Milford office. And a lawyer from the Milford office was hired by the city of Bristol's insurer, Trident Insurance Company. The way it works um, when a municipality gets sued for the most part, and Enfield is no different. It's not the mayor, it's not the town manager, it's not the town attorney who decides when insurance counsel is hired. There's a list of panel counsel um, on a list, and for a variety of different reasons, an insurer may say, we're going to put that firm on that case. Uh, our town manager is not a defendant in that matter, had nothing to do with that matter. Attorney Coppola had nothing to do with that matter, is not involved in that matter. It's an entirely separate group of lawyers, and that does not rise to the level of a conflict. It's a non-issue. Okay. What about the Board of Education for Bristol? Same analysis. There's, I think, another, uh, it's a slip and fall case. Uh, again, it's the Milford office of Birch and Moses, which is a 40 lawyer firm, and Attorney Coppola had nothing to do with that. And, and nor, did, nor did our town manager have okay. anything to do with the hiring. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just bringing forward some homework I did because I feel, as a counselor, it's my due diligence for the residents of Enfield to, to do my homework. Of course. Um, it also looks like you have worked with them through the city of East Hartford because you're the attorney for East Hartford, correct? I, I am the uh, part-time assistant corp counsel. Uh, I've been there for eight months in East Hartford. Um, I uh, Apparently there is a lawyer from that firm who does labor work, Floyd Dugas. Again, out of the Milford office. Um, it has nothing to do with attorney Coppola and he preceded me there. And I don't work with him directly. He reports to uh, others within the city or town of East Hartford. Okay. So I guess lastly, if we're going to be in all fairness, um, Attorney Coppola has had some cases with our assessor where I have those. Um, so in all fairness, I mean, he, he voted against, I mean, he won a case, case against Todd. So I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but so that to me wouldn't be in favor for Todd. May I respond to that? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I believe the lawyer responded to this question when you interviewed him. Um, he is, by trade, uh, a public entity defense lawyer like myself, but he also handles some matters for um, parties who want to contest their um, tax appeal. That makes him ideally situated to address these issues. He knows both sides. And it's my understanding that it was a Connecticut Green Bank with a solar panel farm that contested um, uh, an issue. And it wasn't just Bloomfield. There were, I believe, as many as 20 municipalities that the Connecticut Green Bank filed tax appeals against. Bloomfield happened to be one, so I assume they probably put them on the, the docket together. Um, the attorney indicated that, so uh, our tax assessor was not uh, a client. If anything, he was an adverse party in a matter that is now resolved, and that does not rise to a level of a conflict. Well, again, I'm not an attorney. Don't understand this. But I feel in all fairness, the way I would like to move forward is I do think we need to do a council-led, independent investigation with the help of an outside attorney. But I would like to see an RFP for an outside attorney that we can vet. That is my suggestion. Um, just if I may close the loop on that, there, there were firms we considered who actually did work for the town of Bloomfield, and we felt that because, I mean, that would probably rise to at least it, it maybe the appearance of a conflict if it's someone who our assessor had worked closely with as opposed to having been on the other side. But um, I, I trust that answers your question, uh, questions, Councillor Pisner. Councillor Mangini. Thank you. Thank you, um, Attorney Talberg, for your time, your dedication, and giving up part of your holiday. Very much appreciated. <clears throat> what I have to say is different uh, than my fellow colleagues. And with all due respect, and I truly mean respect, I, I want to get out of the weeds. We're in the weeds right now. I, too, had the opportunity to interview this attorney that... Um, Attorney Talberg did vet several attorneys, several law firms, and this particular attorney rose to the top for varying reasons. Um, none of us here on this dais is qualified, capable, or worthy enough to do this type of work. We, we do have two attorneys here, but I'm sure, and mark my words if I'm incorrect, neither attorney has experience in this field. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. So having said that, my question is, where are we going with this? Where are we going? Is the council going to put on a attorney cap and start doing litigation and research and legal um, findings? I think not. Um, and if that's the case, I want no part of that. Um, but I also feel that at, at this juncture, you know, where where are we going? What, what's the outcome? Do we want to have an investigation, number one? Number two, and if so, are we going to go with a competent, capable attorney that our attorney that we have faith and trust in has uh, vetted out? Or number three, are we going to, some people on this council going to jump in and be the interviewers? I'm totally opposed to that. So my position, and I am the longest sitting member of this council, by the way, so I'm going to say that. I've never experienced anything like this before, but my position is um, to support our town attorney, our town staff, and have faith and trust. Thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Councilor Santanella, and then I have a comment. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I also had an opportunity to talk to the attorney, and... At the beginning of that conversation, I'm going to repeat for those of you who are on the call exactly what I said. There were three things that I was looking to get out of that call. And the first was to understand that the individual that we were interviewing was competent and qualified to do this review. And so let me read to you his bio. Attorney Coppola practices in the areas of municipal law, land use, and zoning 
property tax assessment appeals, general civil litigation, and real estate transactions. He has handled hundreds of land use and zoning tax appeal matters from the administrative level through the Connecticut courts. He has handled property tax appeals involving various types of real estate and real and personal property, including complex and specialized commercial properties totaling billions of dollars over the year. He has been serving as the corporate counsel for the city of Norwalk since 2013. He has also served as the town attorney for the town of Trumbull from 2019 to 2013, and assistant town attorney for the town of Westport since 2006. Attorney Coppola regular, regularly provides representations and services to other municipalities, including the towns of Easton, Madison, New Canaan, Trumbull, Weston, and Wilton. Attorney Coppola has received his bachelor's degree in political science from Boston College in 2001, and his Juris Doctorate uh, from the University of Connecticut Law School in 2004. Attorney Coppola currently serves on the board of directors of the Connecticut Association of Municipal Lawyers, and he has previously served as chairman of the Connecticut Bar Association, planning and zoning section, and chairman for the Fairfield County Bar Association. Those are just some of his qualifications. And just for the record, I also went to Boston College and have a degree in political science, but he's 20 years old, younger than me. So we have never met, in case anybody looks at my history. He is, the, the word tax is not even in our bailiwick. And to contemplate that we would attempt to take, it's dumbfounding to me. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy, but I don't think I could begin to pick through all of this and understand it. The next thing I wanted to know was whether or not there was a conflict. And Councilor Pisner, I found that same case. And it was the, the land use matter. And frankly, the fact that Attorney Coppola is engaged in a land use case is exactly the experience that we would expect him to have. There are 684 cases on the Superior Court docket against the city of Bristol. They've been involved in this one. You found another one. So respectfully, of 684 cases, there are two or three. This is not somebody and a firm that is regularly engaged in business with the city of Bristol. Zero of the cases, zero name our current town manager. She's not a party to any of those cases, not one. So you can go onto the Connecticut database and just type in Ellen's last name, doesn't come up. So there's no, so I'm comfortable that there's no conflict. The third thing that I wanted to know about was whether or not this attorney understood the project. And I think, to your point, Councillor Hopkins, there, we have lots of questions, and I think there are more, there's more input that we can give. But in his response to us, it was clear that he understood the scope of the project at the moment. There were over an hour of testimony that was given in public comment that he can review. There is a paper trail that I assume a attorney of this reputation would thoroughly evaluate. There is so much information on the public record that I find it hard that he would not be able to at least sift through this intelligently and come back with questions and be willing to take on more of our questions. And finally, the sense that I got from him, and I don't know if others who were on the call got the same sense, but he seemed to be pretty empathetic to taxpayers. He commented that this is not a unique situation to Enfield. And he did not seem to have a bias towards municipalities or tax assessors. So I don't understand how we can take, look at somebody with these credentials and suddenly try to feel as though we can do this better on our own. And I think that if the taxpayers, people out there watching, if you think that we have the experience to do this, then I'm going to tell you, I have a lot of concern, and you should too, that we are going to be able to resolve this problem. What we owe to the taxpayers is a resolution, quickly, that we can rely on. And I'm sorry, John Santanella has no credentials whatsoever to do this kind of review. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, a couple of comments that I. Okay, no, go ahead, Councillor Despard. Then I go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. I just wanted to say that um, I'm not sure that anyone, uh, Councillor Santanella, I'm not sure. I certainly am not for a council-led investigation. Um, I, uh, but I do agree with uh, Councillor Pisner that I do think that we do need to start uh, start it ourselves. I do think that we should have an RFP. I think we should have a say in. Um, you know, in selecting a law firm, I think that is just the way to remove any appearance at all of a conflict. Um, but even if so, if, if the majority of the council wants to, to select this lawyer, that's fine. I think the most important thing is, though, that we have an MOU with questions. The council needs to have a say in the scope of the investigation, and there needs to be an MOU, and that has to be approved with whatever lawyer we end up going with. And that's what I, all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, yeah, okay, all right, thanks. Um, there's, there's a couple of comments that I first want to make. From our last meeting to now, I want to thank everybody that has taken pl uh, part of the process that we had outlined. Uh, and thank you to Attorney Talbert for setting up those interviews that we had the opportunity to, uh, you know, talk to get our uh, ideas together, uh, questions, Councillor Hopkins, these, these questions are fantastic. Um, just scoping them out very quickly. Thank you for that. Um, I think the, what we've been discussing here is that we are, I know I do not feel comfortable in doing any sort of investigation. We are definitely not qualified. I totally agree with uh, Councillor uh, Santanello and his um, uh, observations of everything that he discussed here tonight. I do want to make this recommendation moving forward uh, that I would recommend with uh, Attorney Talberg that we move forward and we make a commitment to hiring an attorney that we do have, and not to have 10 people, but to have two liaisons, one uh, from the uh, Democrat side and one from the Republican side. And and I am gonna make this recommendation now because we, we've had some talk and we've had some discussion. I would uh, highly recommend uh, Councilor Ludwig uh, to be a liaison uh, with uh, Attorney Talberg. And I also am gonna make the recommendation of Councilor Santanella uh, as being a liaison for this group so that questions that we can formulate, that we can go through them and with Councillor Santella, because to have 10 people putting in their input, I just don't think that, it's, that it would flow correctly. Um, so questions, and, and they would come back to us with any sort of reports that come back through uh, uh, Attorney Talberg to help with this process, to expedite the, uh, the issues mo moving forward. But that would be my uh, recommendation uh, to the council right here, to have uh, a liaison through uh, Attorney Talberg with the firm that, um, you know, if we move forward and, and hire this firm, that would be uh, something uh, that we should really take a really hard, close look at. Uh, you know, a few weeks back, uh, you know, Councillor Ludwig did come up and did make that recommendation that we should have an independent person uh, take a look at, you know, these issues that, that were brought forward with us. And hearing tonight that there's only six tax appeals going to Superior Court, that's pretty good. That's awesome. It's great. You guys did a fantastic job. You know, the people are happy with the decisions that were being made by by the uh, BAA group. So, uh, you know, we, we want to move forward with this. And so my, my recommendation is, you know, let, let's, let's hire the, for an independent review. We're not looking at it as an investigation, but a review of what we, was discussed. And then we can come up with uh, questions that we can give to the attorney uh, moving forward, but um, but the the two liaisons, 
to work with Attorney Talberg is my recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ludwig, and Thank then you. Councillor uh, Right. Geyer. So I think, you know, I think this has sort of taken a life of its own since we started chatting about this. So I think, Attorney Talbot, you've got to step back a little bit and unpeel the onion here a little bit. So whether state statute allows any individual certain authority or rights to do, do things, the question becomes, again, how, how do you use that authority, right? So as you go back and you look at, especially again when the letters went out in the 490, regardless of what your, your you know, again, your opinion is, the tie should go to the taxpayer. Obviously, that was not our approach as a town. We didn't have that approach. The tie did not go to the taxpayer. I understand the state statute says the burden falls on the taxpayer. I get that. But that doesn't mean as a town that that's not the burden we want to have on, a, on, on an ongoing basis or even on a current basis with our taxpayers. And I think there's a lot of policy issues within here that needs to be addressed because I think from a policy perspective, we have failed the taxpayers, in my opinion. I'm talking about government, not to not blame anyone. Government has failed the taxpayers on this. And, and, and so, so my point is, like, if you like football and you see a 15-yard out and there's a catch and it's 25 different angles whether the receiver has the ball in his hands and two feet in bounds, and it takes up half the game. So whether folks feel people are qualified or not to be able to, to address this, the fact that other counselors now are asking good questions is exactly what your job is. So I don't care what your political philosophy is. I don't care what your expertise is. It's your job is to make sure, that, and that's the point of what we're trying to do here, that you do what you feel is best based on ho how you're elected. And your job is to ask questions. Your job is to make sure there's a catch and two feet and bounce. Because that's what you do in football, and it takes 25 minutes of the game as a counselor, whether you're a tax expert or not, Man, when you see the street, if you've talked to the taxpayer, especially folks with the 490, man, they, they feel aggrieved. I mean, let's not mince words here. They feel aggrieved. And again, that's the point of this is to get to that. And for me, this can't happen again. I don't care if it's revaluation. I don't care if it's a regular tax year. This cannot happen again. This is not the way government should treat its residents, in my opinion. So I don't care what your political beliefs are. This should never have gotten to the point where we're at. And so for some of the counselors who I get or, you know, want to make sure there's no, a very non, a clear non-conflict non -conf of interest, because they've heard some of the sort of the residents feel, even though they may have won their appeal, they still feel aggrieved. They feel they should have never had to go to get to an appeal. So I guess your question is, do, is the ends justify the means or, does, or is the means more important than the ends? For me, it's always the means are more important than the ends. So I don't care if I win or lose, but if I try to do it the right way, I feel pretty good about it. That's just for me as, as an individual. And so... When I asked for this, again, I interviewed the individual, seemed very competent, but every council has to understand, I think, you gotta be comfortable with what we're doing, and we can't just sit back, even if we're not running the investigation as I'm not suggesting we should. But I, I agree, the investigation should come through the council. Okay, that, so, and I'm sorry, nothing against the town manager's office, but they, have, they, they may get interviewed for this, and they probably should. So that should come through us. That's our job, and I think Councilor Hopkins mentioned the point in the, the charter where we should be running that investigation. So for me, I don't want to have a town a council run investigation, but we need to be able to work with the lawyer and make sure to all these questions, this is a very good outline by Councilor Hopkins and others that will come through it, because the end goal is this can't happen again. And there's others, I mean, I, I, I know how to say this without you know, crossing any lines here, but. It just this is not the way government should be treating its residents. And and it's interesting, the people who probably were getting away with it, so to speak, well, because we went after everybody, well those folks admitted it quietly, they're they're Cheshire Cat, they're gone. They don't have to worry about, hey, well, you know, yeah, I've been kinda of getting away with it for all these years. They but the folks who actually were doing the right thing, and maybe they missed a piece of paperwork here, maybe whatever, they're the ones now who are griefed. Man, that's not the right way to do business, in my opinion. And I don't, I'm, I'm an insurance guy, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know one thing: the tie should go to the taxpayer. And if if that's your basis, then this is an easy investigation, or whatever word you want to use. But I do feel it's an investigation because government sent out the letters to the taxpayer. Okay, the taxpayers didn't ask the government for the letters. That's how it worked. We sent the letters out. Of, we're still sending letters out, from my understanding which is, again, nerve-wracking, nerve to be honest with you, if we're still doing this at this point. And so, uh, we're trying to wrap this up in an opinion. 
Again, I don't want to have a council run investigation. I appreciate the recommendation. Again, I have no. I understand folks want to go on RFP as well. I, so I understand those points. I really do. I understand you want this to be as transparent as possible and as fair to everybody, including the people on it and our staff. They deserve fairness as well. For me, I don't want to delay this. As long as the council is running or having the direct input with the lawyer, I'm okay with the lawyer that, that we interviewed. But we are the ones that have to have the direct contact. And if we don't, I will vote no, even though I'm the one that's been calling for this for four months. Because this, this means has to have an end. And if we don't do it the right way, whatever credibility we may or may not have as a council, it's gone. And then we have appeals coming in September. And a lot of people just got their car taxes. And I've already heard some things on their car taxes. So this is not going away. And so this has to be done the right way, it has to be transparent. And it's got to be even in and I, and I, all my years of being in politics, I've never seen a town go after a appointed board the way this has turned into. I have to be up front. I, I don't care what the board is. This can't, this has got to be fixed. I mean, this has got to be fixed. And um, so I know that's a lot in one, one uh, section, but yeah, again, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I don't want to turn this into some sort of sideshow because it, it, then it does the taxpayers a disservice. And I don't want to do the taxpayers who have already been aggrieved any more a disservice than they've already went through because some of them may be getting ready to appeal their stuff in September. And honestly, so I guess the question becomes, whatever your government philosophy is, do you want to have, if the burden's on a taxpayer, do we want to make sure every single year now they have to come before the board, of, no matter who's on a board of assessment appeals, hey, I got I to appeal my taxes every single year. And, and the good news is the folks who can appeal to Superior Court usually can afford that kind of attorney. And I know most of the folks who would love maybe want to appeal to Superior Court can't afford that attorney. And that's a big deal to me. And so... And also, they shouldn't have to feel every year they got to go and appeal something when they, again, if they've proven it once, uh, I know I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not illegally, but double jeopardy seems to come into play here when every year they got to go back and reprove it. At some point, government should be held accountable. And again, if someone has a piece of paper they're missing in their file over a 490 or whatever it may be, an exempt status, a veteran status, whatever it may be, our approach should be, look, hey, could you fill this out so you're compliant? Not, hey, look, you've lost your 490, you got to go appeal. That's exactly the approach we took, and it's wrong. It's wrong, and it has to be rectified. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Ungar. Thank you. Um, with all this being said, um, I think we all agree that there needs to be an investigation, and I believe that a lot of the residents of this community, they're distraught. They've had sleepless nights. They were thinking they have to sell their property. And these are serious concerns that they have. And I believe that we owe due diligence to all the residents of this community and to the, the BAA that has done all this hard work. Um, we're not debating should there be an investigation. I think we all agree that there should be. And, and the recommendation that we're given, that's what it is. It's a recommendation. It doesn't mean that we have to take it, and it doesn't mean we're not going to have any other attorney. I have a list of a dozen other attorneys that do tax appeals that, that we could look into. So I'm saying if there's any type of crossover that Councillor Pisner has, has even mentioned, why not take the high road? Why not rise above? Because there's a few connections here and just get someone else. And I just think we owe that to the BAA. We owe that to the residents of this community, everyone. Okay, Deputy Mayor Scala. Thanks, very briefly. Um, thank you, Jim, for your overview. Um, I, I will say that I wrote down some of the things that people were saying, and council-led does not equal independent review, let's be honest. If we want this to be truly independent, we should not be leading the, the, um, this review. I think that we should submit questions. I know that we asked that questions be submitted, so I think that's a good idea. I don't know if these have been submitted, but if they not, if they haven't been, let's do so. I think if other people have questions, they should submit them regarding the scope, or if they have questions on specific items or issues, let's submit that too. Um, but also, um, Councilor Ludwig said, you know, this is the side show. And then unfortunately, this has turned into a show. And it's absolutely unacceptable. The taxpayers, the residents, the town employees, and this council all want the outcome that is best for everybody. 
So let's get the independent review started. Let's get it done so we can all sleep better and not have any more sleepless nights. So let's vote tonight and do this independent review. Okay, thank you. Councilor Finger. Well, I guess I gotta put my two cents in since everybody else has. I'm sitting here listening to everybody and I'm thinking back of how this all started, what was going on, how, how we had as a council no voice on the direction of what we were gonna do about this issue. And as a new counselor, and following the charter, that kind of upset me. It upset me that we were not involved with this. Now we're involved and we're de trying to determine what's the best route. I'm just a street guy. Anybody who knows me, I'm a street guy. Hey, Bob. Hold on. Thanks, Bob. I'm not a college educated individual. I'm just a street guy. And I don't like being disrespected when it comes to we had a majority of people that wanted to meet in a special meeting and nobody showed up for it, didn't, couldn't make it. That's disrespectful. There was no reasoning, no terms of why it went in this direction. So I'm in favor of the RFP. I'm gonna back that up because I've had many people talk to me. I've had many people show me things that have made a soup and it's just, it just keeps getting stared. And I don't know if that terminology, because my last meeting I said something that nobody understood about laundry, okay? But I think it's right that, that we go in a direction that we make the decisions as a council. That's why I did this, because I, this is why I ran, to make decisions for our taxpayers. And I think you're right. I think that the, the people over here and the people next to me over here, uh, on the side of John, uh, Councilor uh, Santino, excuse me, you can call me John. It's okay. Thank, that's right. Thanks, John. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm, and I'm not saying that the word is the right thing, but I, I, but we need to make that decision. We need to make that decision. That's our responsibility. That's the way I look at it. And uh, thank you, Councilor Pisner. Well, I'm going to agree with you, Councilor Finger. It's a miracle. Um, I, too, don't have a college education as you do, but I have a pulse on this community. I'm born and raised here, and my phone has rung off the hook. I've gotten emails. I've gotten texts to the point where my husband is like, you're never running again. I'm like, well, maybe. Um, we owe this to the residents of Enfield. They put us in these seats because they trusted us. I take that very seriously. And I think the only way we are going to gain the trust of our residents again is, as Councilman Finger said, and, and the majority of us up here is, we do need to investigate this or, or review it or whatever the word is, but we need to be a part of who's being chosen. We need to be 100% transparent. We need, I, I agree with liaisons 100% on that, but we need to get this done and we need to do it right. It's not so much about speed as it is about accuracy. There are people's reputations on the line here too. And I've said it again and I will say it. We have a Board of Appeals that is exemplary. And I'm sure I said that word wrong, but they are three highly respected people in this community. They aren't people that just said, hey, I'd like to come in and do it. They know what they're doing. And they have a stake in this town. So I would like to go to an RFP for an attorney. I agree with the liaisons, but I do think we have, we have charge on this. It is up to us to make those decisions. So that's it. M Mr. Mayor, through you, if I may respond. Attorney Talbert. Yeah, um, when I made my presentation two weeks ago, Councilor Finger uh, and Councilor Pisner, I suggested uh, you could do an RFP, and uh, I understood that um, you were upset that you felt like that night, two weeks ago, you didn't have enough information, and I had talked to you privately about that. It, my understanding is this had gone through leadership, and there was a consensus for us to act quickly, 
And I told you, I had been involved in another RFP for a municipality that was expecting an onslaught of tax appeals. So we had done that to get outside counsel to handle the expected onslaught. I know from being in this business, it's my day job and my night job and my weekend job, I know who's going to respond to that RFP. And I know, going down that list, who's conflicted out because they have tax appeals pending against the town of Enfield uh, or they have some association. Uh, at the BAA meeting, there was a member who had a list of 17 law firms from an internet search. I've gone through that list. You're not going to, that, that, I can go through them one by one and explain why they are not the best candidate or why they um, have, you know, they're conflicted. Seven of them have hard conflicts. Um, so it's your prerogative. We're, we're ready to act. Attorney Coppola is ready to, if you want to have this addressed in the near term, it can be done. If you want to slow boat it and have it be something that goes on the back burner, you can do an RFP. It's going to take town staff. Just think about the logistics. And I'm not trying to influence you one way or the other, but it's a reality. They got to put the RFP together. It has to be advertised. There has to be a sufficient period for the firms to put together their package. It's summer. People are on vacation. So what do you do? You announce it for 30 days out or 45 days out. You're going to add a few months at, 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 the, at the least. Um, and you're going to end up right back where we are. And it, it, we're going to have a, a small list of candidates. Uh, and, and if that is your prerogative, it matters not to me. Just understand um, the time issue. Councillor Fager. Well, what you just said was that you got direction from leadership to go through with this, correct? Is that what you just said? Uh, yeah, this is how the council agenda. Let me, let me, agenda, let me, let me yeah, finish. Yeah, let me finish, yeah. please. I didn't interrupt you. So you said leadership went through this with you to go ahead with this direction of, the, of this law firm. <laughs> leadership never no, notified any. Did anybody else get notified that they were doing this? That's not what he said. Yeah, that's what I think he said through leadership. That's what no. that was a direction. The way the agenda gets set is the Wednesday before leadership is involved in the agenda. It was my understanding. I thought that the word had gone out through leadership. Nope. Nope. No transparency. It just no. Er, Excuse Attorney me. Coppola said that he could not. He said he was ready, but with summer vacation and such, he said honestly he would probably get to this end of July, end of September. He said 60 days and the interview, if I remember correctly. It was 30 to 60 days I'm, and then 90. So if you want to speak to this, John. Yeah, no, I, I believe what he said was he would be done in 60 days. That's what he said. No, that's, that's what he said. That, well, that's okay. Well, I'm just that's what I heard him say. You're asking. Yeah. My recollection is that the anticipated completion date was roughly 60 to 90 days, not that he would start it in 60. Days. He said with vacation and such, he had vacation this summer planned. He, he made it to me. I took my takeaway, and I, I mean, I, I have my notes that I wrote down. Um, my takeaway was it wasn't going to happen right away. Um, No, actually, I think what he said was um, it's pretty straightforward, and he wanted to do it expeditiously. He didn't think that, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to take a lot of too much time. Uh, the, I, I have a very distinct recollection about that, but. Okay, th thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I think this stuff is. Thank you. This stuff is important enough that we need to make sure we're doing this right. Um, I don't think we should be, uh, you know, I don't think anybody wants to take a long period of time to do this, but I don't think we should be in a particular rush. We need to make sure it's done correctly. Now, if we were to approve this resolution tonight, I mean, we are not getting any of these questions answered. There's, a, there's an idea that maybe they'll be put forward later, but only through, you know, two liaisons. I think we have to get our ducks in a row. I think this has to be explicit so that we can talk to the public about it. This is, we know exactly what's happening, exactly what questions are going to be answered uh, before we go forward. And I think this would be pretty easy to put into um, a memorandum of understanding to be voted on in the near future if ultimately a majority did want to go with this particular firm. Uh, I 
I mean, I've done a lot of work just to lay it out. I want to make sure everybody's questions are asked. I want to make sure that everybody is getting feedback from this law firm. I don't think there's any reason why we should have special liaisons who are only receiving updates from the, the independent counsel. The counsel is hiring the independent law firm, and I think it's important that we get those updates uh, so that we can talk to constituents who are very concerned about this issue and who, frankly, are losing sleep. So that would be my request with this is let's make sure everybody's questions are incorporated up front so we know they're getting answered. And then when we uh, vote ultimately to approve an independent law firm, that's part of it. And I think that's pretty clear. Thank you. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Councilor, Deputy Mayor Scala. Second. Second. Uh, Councilor Santanello. Meeting is adjourned. We'll start the public hearing, the public hearing ground rules. The following notice of public hearing was published in the Hartford Current on Tuesday, June 21st, 2022, Town of Enfield Legal Notice. The Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Tuesday, July 5th, 2022, at 6.50 p.m. is approximately 6.57. To allow interested residents an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the proposed amendments to the Enfield Town Code, Chapter 22, Article 2, Enfield Cultural and Arts Commission Ordinance. For more information, contact the Office of Economic and Community Development at 860-253-6391 or ntereso at enfield.org. Uh, dated this 21st day of June, 2022, Sheila M. Bailey, Town Clerk. The ground rules for tonight's public hearing. A, there is no time limit, but I ask that each person not to take up too much time so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak. B, after each person who desires has had one chance to speak, I shall permit those individuals who desire a second chance. After those individuals who desire to speak a second time, I shall permit those individuals desire a third, fourth, etc. Once again, please refrain from personalities. Okay. All right. Is there anybody that uh, would like to come forward? for tonight's public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to come forward for the second time? Okay, I declare the <clears throat> public hearing closed. Thank you.
Good evening. Welcome to the regular Enfield Town Council meeting, July 5th. The time is 7.03 in council chambers. You can also view this on YouTube. Uh, we'll begin our meeting with a prayer offered by Councillor Ludwig. All right, we're going to talk about something different. A prayer for good humor. St. Thomas More. Grant us, O oh Lord, good, good digestion and also something to digest. Grant us a healthy body and the necessary good humor to maintain it. Grant us a simple soul that knows to treasure all that is good and that doesn't frighten easily at the sight of evil, but rather finds the means to put things back in their place. Give us a soul that knows, not boredom, grumblings, sigh, and laments, nor excess of stress because of that obstructing thing called I. Grant us, Lord, a sense of good humor. Allow us the grace to be able to take a joke, to, dis to discover in life a bit of joy, and to be able to share it with others. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now call upon our town clerk, Sheila Bailey, to call roll. Councilor Ludwig. Here. Councilor Mangini. Here. Councilor Pisner. Here. Councilor Santanella. Here. Councilor Ungeyer. Here. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Here. Mayor Crisati. Here. Councilor Despard. Here. Councilor Finger. Here. Councilor Hopkins. Here. Ten members are present and none are absent. Okay, fire evacuation. In the event of a fire, there are exits in the back of the chambers and to my left in the audience is right. Exit through the doors, go downstairs and into the parking lot. Minutes of preceding uh, uh, meetings. Uh, does anybody have, or do I have a motion to approve the regular uh, meeting minutes June 20th, 2022? So moved. Uh, Councilor Mangini. Second. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala, uh, are there any changes, any discussions or corrections? Sensing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? And abstentions? One abstention. So motion will carry. Nine in favor, one abstention. Uh, there are no special guests tonight. Uh, public communications and petitions. Uh, the rules for this section is everybody's going to have five minutes uh, in the first round and three minutes for the second round. In the last meeting, I was very generous uh, because I really felt that town council feels strongly that the public has a right to be heard. However, I'm not going to be allowing comments aimed at town employees. As I'm sure everyone can appreciate, there are always multiple sides to the story. I reserve to write then public communication if it gets to a point where I believe there is a risk of liability or exposure to the town based on comments or the infringement of an employee's right to due process. Uh, so when you come up, please just please state your name and address for the record. Uh, be respectful. And uh, so, Public communications are open. Uh, yeah, we have a uh, one hour limit. And remember, first round, five minutes, second round, uh, three minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Jessica Soule, and I live at 10 Brook Road here in Enfield. I am a fourth grade teacher at Prudence Crandall School. This summer, I'm working as a teacher for summer school. Crandall hosts the summer school program, thanks in part to the AC units that are in our school. Summer Lunch Bunch provides free breakfast and lunch to children in our district, and ERFC hosts the summer camp programs all within my school. This means that there are several hundred students in the building, age kindergarten through fifth grade, from about 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. This also includes the before and after care programs. 
In my opinion, 11 hours is a very long time for a building to be in a building that is not as safe as it should be. I have seen multiple news articles in the JI and emails from our superintendent and statements made here to me in public and in emails from the board and council members that quote, everything is being done that can be done to ensure the safety and security of the students and staff. And I once again say to this council, it is not, it is not enough. The five actions that I requested at the last meeting are number one, classroom doors that lock from the inside. Teachers are expected to walk out into the hallway to secure our classroom doors. When I am at home alone and my husband is at work late and I hear something strange outside, I don't go out onto my porch to lock my house. I lean over, I flip my deadbolt from the comfort and security of my house. Number two, mirrored one-way films on the windows and doors, especially in the classrooms, hallways, and entry points. Summers Elementary School has this safety feature in place. Let's look at it. Number three, classroom evacuation windows that open far enough to safely get my students out. As I've mentioned before, my windows open to a maximum 45-degree angle and a maximum width of nine inches. This is a photograph of the actual window in my classroom that is open to the fullest distance that it can get to. The maximum space is nine inches. That's this big, as I've mentioned. I can't get myself out of that window. I can't get any students. I have two windows like this in my classroom. Two door entry systems, such as we see at the high school, at JFK, at Alcorn, and other buildings in the district. Barring that, I would like to see number five, concrete blockades at the front entrance of the building. This would be to prevent anyone from using a vehicle to gain entry into my building. When I came to this council on June 20th, I certainly didn't expect miracles to happen for my five actionable items to be done immediately. I was given the impression that an inventory or evaluation would begin on my building to verify the claims that I have made here at the council. I had hoped that when I watched the joint facilities meeting on June 30th that my concerns would be addressed. In the final 90 seconds of this meeting, Council Pisnar, I think I'm saying her name right, asked if uh, her email had been received with a list of concerns from teachers regarding building security. It was, the reply was, we are working on it. It's in progress. David should be finished very soon. He also went on to say, there's a lot more to it than that. It's a lot more to it than this project. It's a lot of doors. Yeah, you're right. It's a lot of doors. There's a lot of children behind those doors. Those doors being locked quickly may be the only thing that saves the lives of students and teachers in the event of a shooting. After I spoke here on June 20th, I received questions about the safety of the door handles that I was requesting. Some people asked if the type of door handle that I was looking at would meet the standards for a fire code. An ideal handle would push and lock from the inside, something that looks like this, but still allow someone inside the room to escape the room in the event of a fire. There are currently two classrooms within Crandall that have this exact type of door handle. It can be locked from the inside with a push and a twist, and then when the danger has passed, it can be unlocked with a key from the outside. This simple step of changing the door handles could save lives. I may be the only teacher you see sitting here tonight bringing up these concerns. I may be the only teacher in this district who's willing to stand up and speak my truth to you tonight. Prudence Crandall Elementary School is not a safe school. It's not. I go there every day, and now I go there all summer, and I say that it is not a safe school. My school is not as safe as being promised in the news articles and in emails. In the event of an active shooter in my building, I don't know that I could keep my students safe. I don't sleep well at night knowing that I don't think I can keep my students safe. I don't. I've come to this town council again to ask for these five steps to be taken this summer. I get it. There's a lot of kids in the building. Let's get it done. I plan to return to Excuse the council me. to continue to ask. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next. Good evening. Good evening. My name is George Hendrickson. 
I'm a veteran that lives here in Enfield. I spent 29 years, six months, and 11 days serving our country in the United Excuse States Army. Excuse me, sir. Your, <laughs> yes. Your address, please. 26 Roy Street, and oh, okay. right here thank, in Enfield. I'm you. sorry. I thought no. I said that in the beginning. No. Thank you. I may have mumbled it because I get nervous when I start speaking in the beginning until the Army comes out in me. Uh, <laughs> I had the pleasure of Thank paying you. my taxes. You're very welcome. I had the pleasure of paying my taxes uh, on July 1st. Um, I didn't get the bill till June 30th, and it was due July 1st, late effective 1 August. Um, I got the car bill, and I thought that when I purchased my car that I applied that bill to the car, my tax exemption. I'm a 100% disabled veteran. So I thought I was going to get a break. What I found out when I got down to the tax assessor's office is what I didn't get that break that the assessor thought that it would benefit me better than if I applied it to my house. Um, I've been here since 2000, been a part of Enfield since 2004, and I've always been able to apply that to my car and not my house. I totally understand that my car depreciates over time, but eventually I pay nothing. I get a break until I pay nothing. Uh, when I asked the assessor, um, who was he to make that decision for me? He said that he was the assessor and he's authorized to make that decision according to this, this, the state statutes. I did the research on that and I could barely find nothing in 1281 and in um, 203 or in 204. I couldn't find it. When I turned in my appeal, uh, yet today, I had the pleasure of meeting our town manager one-on-one, -on -one, Ms. Sasso. Um, it was a pleasant experience. The customer service that she gave me versus the assessor was impeccable. Um, I did not enjoy his customer service at all. Um, some of the things that he informed me was I need to save more money going forward, uh, as, as well as, again, it's his decision on how that money is applied. Ms. Sasso did some great research for me. Uh, she helped me find out some of the answers, and what she told me was that the BAA uh, is silent on the issue. So I guess silent means that you abstain and however it goes, it goes. If the veteran decides to come down to the assessor's office and make a decision on where he or she would like her taxes applied to, they, they, they should do that. The customer service reflects that they should do that. I went and paid the taxes anyway because I didn't know how long the fight was going to be, but I would like that going forward uh, hopefully I get to see the appeals board in September, but going forward that if a veteran goes to the assessor's office and says, hey, I, I'd like to apply my current taxes to my car because I may have forgotten that the assessor has the customer service to say, hey, that's a member of Enfield. That's where he lives. That's where he pays his taxes. That's where he shops. And that person is afforded, that veteran is afforded the opportunity to transfer that. Although the, the, the bill may go to the mortgage company and be a little bit different, I'm sure that it, it'll get squared away. Um, had he applied those taxes to my car, I would have saved approximately 53% on a $924 bill. But his decision to apply that to my mortgage, I only netted $321. So his decision did not benefit me. My decision would have. And I'm off my soapbox. You guys have a great evening. Thank you very much. Um, through the mayor, um, yeah. just so we can keep uh, in time with the comments from Mr. Hendrickson, I did want to just make one quick correction. He and I discussed a lot of information this afternoon, but I do want to just clarify that when he said that the BAA was silent on the application, um, what he meant was my relation to him that the state statute was silent on the application of a veteran's exemption. So in the absence of that, and I, I think you heard a lot about this from Attorney Talberg earlier, um, we went through the state statute and then I reverted to the um, the state handbook for assessors. And there is an entire section um, that talks about the property on which a veteran's exemption may be applied, including dwellings on leased land and leased vehicles. And this is the section that um, he too researched. But so it's in here that for best practices, which we've talked about, it is customary for assessors to reduce a veteran's real property assessment by the amount of his exemption when legally permissible. Real property assessments are generally higher than those for motor vehicles, and there are fewer transfers of real estate as compared to sales of motor vehicles in a given year. This practice, therefore, facilitates the assessor's administration of veterans' exemptions. Furthermore, 
Back in 1966, the Connecticut Attorney General opinion states that in the statutes providing exemptions to, quote, specified veterans or qualified relatives, there is no distinction made between real or personal property and no right of election by a taxpayer to have exemptions applied to a particular type of property is provided. Thus, it is the assessor who chooses the property on which a veteran's exemption is to be applied. Now, brought to light in this whole discussion is the fact that Mr. Hendrickson is right. The, the excessive valuation issues with used cars, with cars in general, the fact that people are buying larger models shows that some of the value has shifted from tax burdens and that when the statute is silent, it means that the assessor can choose. And in discussions with the assessor's office this afternoon, they are going to honor the moving forward piece for Mr. Hendrickson that for both vehicles that he has specified, his veteran's exemption is going to be applied therefore. He has chosen to not have that retroactive. He already paid his taxes. He made that very clear in our conversation. But what, what I think is also important is this is yet another wrinkle and, and fluctuation with our whole assessor issue. But this one specifically, I think, is something that you as town council and we as administration need to really advertise out to our public that they have this choice, that there is now this opportunity for us to facilitate a better understanding of this specific assessment process and let people know that this is the process that they should follow if they choose to do as Mr. Hendrickson did and apply it specifically. What's even more important though is that the burden to do this on an annual basis falls to the taxpayer. If you want to make sure that your assessment is applied appropriately, it's your job to come and make sure that your files are kept up. I'm going to use an example. Um, a $10,000 uh, value for a veteran's exemption could be applied to a house, which means it lowers your assessment by which you're going to be taxed by $10,000, or you can apply it to your car. Uh, you know, let's say that your car, you purchased your car for $40,000. You can apply the $10,000 to that. It'll lower your assessment to 30. You will then be assessed on 70% of that. But what if you drive a clunker. Wonder if your car is only worth $7,000. You have a $10,000 exemption. You can literally come to the assessor's office and say, apply it to my car, which in essence means that you're going to get zero taxes. You're going to get a zero tax bill. But you have $3,000 left over that you have an eligible exemption on. You can shift that to your real estate but you have to verbalize that. So this is a whole issue that I think is important for us as ambassadors to the town and policymakers to make sure people understand. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Mayor, but I thought just for continuity's sake, it's important for all of you to see the, the lengths that Mr. Hendrickson went through and then the resolution thereof and how it can benefit other taxpayers. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad that that got situated for you. Okay. Yep. Next. Wendy Bayou, 23 Glen Oak Drive. Um, I have a couple of issues I wanted to talk about. First, I'm in complete agreement with Mrs. Soul. First of all, she had my son for fourth grade. He's now going into eighth grade, and she is amazing, and Enfield is lucky to have her. She loves her students as her very own kids, and she would do anything for them, so I truly believe it's keeping her up at night worrying about their safety. Um, as a mom, I dread the call that the school's in a real lockdown with a real threat. That has only happened once to me when I had two kids at EHS. All of the teachers, admin, and rest of the staff did a great job keeping our kids safe, and I thanked them for that when I saw them. I don't think anybody, you know, 20 years ago went into the teaching profession expecting that they would have to keep their kids safe as they do today. But why isn't our town doing its part to make sure everyone in the schools are as safe as possible? Please do your part as a mom, as a friend to many teachers. Making our schools safe should be a priority now to prevent a tragedy later. Second, I had a child graduate from EHS on June 22nd. It was a great night, rain stopped in time <laughs> for the kids to walk down the hill, just like last year. The kids were awesome. It was about the kids as it should be. 
it was quick, hour and 45 minutes or so for over 300 kids. I know my friend's son graduated from Bolton and it took almost three hours. They have way less kids. <laughs> um, the speeches by the class president, salutatorian, valedictorian, were amazing, well thought out. Uh, the speeches by the adults were brief, which was very appreciated by us the parents because we have a short time with the kids after graduation for pictures. So you can imagine my dismay that a member of this very council was upset how graduation was handled. I mean, why should it be about the kids who are earning their diplomas, their first diploma, maybe their only diploma? Why shouldn't they be the center of attention? Why should other adults who have had their chance on that stage earning their diploma, why should it be about them? Our kids have had two years, very hard years of high school, and they earn this probably more than some of the other students in the past. The graduation was about the graduates, as requested by the graduates. To imply these young adults are not capable of these decisions is insulting to them, as well as to the parents who raised them. I know many of these young men and women. They are smart, compassionate, they volunteer their time, they have high GPAs, they study hard, they work, they volunteer, they babysit activities. They are bright people who are our future, and it's, our future is bright, unlike what a lot of people think. Um, I did send an email with my concerns to every council member. I only received three replies, so thank you for your replies. I appreciate that. I also want to point out the Safe Grad Committee put on a fantastic, fun-filled, and safe night for these young men and women. They sacrificed their own sleep that night, and they spent the better part of over a year raising funds so our kids could have a free evening, and I could sleep at home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Karen LaPlante, 166 North Maple Street. Um, you need to put on your WPCA hats for a second, because I see there's an item on the agenda I wanted to bring up. Um, I won't read it all because it's lengthy and I have two, one other item I want to talk about. Um, so basically as a WPCA there are three billing options. Um, the first option uh, is a water meter based billing cycle. Sewer use charges shall be computed and billings distributed on a quarterly basis. Quarterly sewer fees will be based upon quarterly water use. The second option for billing is a sewer meter based billing cycle. Sewer use charges shall be computed by multiplying the quarterly volume of sewerage from the user by the established sewer rate. And the third billing option is listed under C of section 86-203, um, non-meter based billing cycle. Sewer use charges shall be computed by multiplying quarterly average residential or commercial industrial, use, industrial usage by the established sewer rate. Those are your three options for billing. Uh, the sewer service fees shows the rates for those services. Um, and just an item that's bugged me from the beginning. The rate for water consumption of under 20,000 gallons right now is $3.60 per thousand gallons. And anything over 20,000 is billed at $5.39 per thousand gallons. This is the rate for all water meter based billings. There is also a base quarterly charge based on the meter size. I've got one question though. What happens if you exactly hit 20,000 gallons? What's the rate? One of those should say equal to or greater than or less than or equal to. And that's been going on from the beginning. But anyway, that's not what this is about. Um, I'm sure it's happened, but I don't know how the billing system has made it happen. Yeah. <laughs> don't we always? Um, the issue that has come up um, is the fact that a new owner of a premises bought a building with a two inch meter and is using it as a residence. Um, the base charge for a two inch meter is $312 per quarter and the consumption is added to that amount. 
The property owner has a few options. They can install a sewer meter and be billed according to the sewer use rate, um, the sewer consumption rate, and, and that also comes with a $50 per quarter charge for a sewer meter reading. Um, they can install a smaller water meter, which will not only save them water company charges, but sewer charges after the, the initial plumbing costs. And that initially would be the cheapest option for them at this point. Um, they can install a separate water service for the residents to serve only the residents and discontinue the use temporarily of the two inch water service line currently servicing the building. You tell the water company, shut off my two inch line, I have a new residential line with a three quarter inch meter or one inch meter and, and he's all set there. And also when he does create the commercial space, he now has two services with separate meters and the, right, the proper people will be built, whether he's living there or someone else. Um, if you decide to allow a credit for this customer, let me remind you of all the has of a water customers that came forward because of their one inch meter policy that, are, that requires them to have an, a one inch meter when it used to be that a five eighths inch meter was adequate for most residential uses. Uh, when we had our water company, all of our residential water meters were five eighths inch meters. The sewer rate for a 5 8 inch meter is $39, and the rate for a 1 inch meter is $97.50. It's a big difference. They'll all be coming in for adjustments. <laughs> Remember, the sewer rates are not based on service size. Everybody uses the wrong terminology. It's not service size, it's meter size. Except for the large commercial establishments, we probably all have the same sewer pipe going out to the street but it is much more costly to meter the discharge than it is to meter the water supply. So how much time do I have left, do you know? 10 seconds. Okay, I'll come back. <laughs> Hi, my name is Donna corbin Siminski. I'm here as Inland Wetlands Chairman. <clears throat> um, as you know, we're involved in a couple lawsuits. We have asked repeatedly to speak with the uh, attorneys representing us, and we keep getting told no. <clears throat> I think that's in violation of our rights. We should be able to talk to the attorney, ask him more questions, and have him give us answers, and ask us questions. So I'm here to ask you, we wanna see the attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. Good evening, my name's Liz Davis and I reside at 201 North Maple Street. First off, I wanna thank the town manager for a quick response and being candid to take care of a veteran and to get things squared away and moving. I believe that's who was talking. I was only hearing it on the way, so I believe it was you talking um, while I was listening. So I do wanna say thank you for that. The next concern, that makes very big concern, as pretty much a lot of people in town, it was over eight years ago, what got me involved in politics in this town and fighting was making sure our schools were secured for our children, our staff, our teachers. I am trying to keep my cool as much as I can to find out. We're kind of lied to and sitting up there as a town counselor, a prior town counselor, I was told the schools were all safe. I was told all the hardening was done everywhere. I'm not one that wants to mention things to announce that a school is unsafe or anything. But I have let the teacher know that I've talked to a few of you sitting up there and you have give your word of honor. You're gonna make sure these schools are hard and correctly now. I understand the last majority blatantly lied to this town. Please don't do that again. Please do what's right. And honestly, if we had a town counselor spending less time saying what we should do at graduation and taking the rights from our children of how they want their graduation and actually take that time and energy into making sure our schools are hardened. I think that's more of your job, not the Board of Ed. 
And also when it comes to inland wetlands, I hope we do the right thing by them, because that's wrong. And by town charter, the town attorney is supposed to be there for residents too if they want a petition and stuff. So I'm not sure why we're gonna have an issue that inland wetlands can't get a legal review or give them the funds to go outside, because honestly, I think a lot more things need to be done by outside people for investigations. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. All right. Good evening. First, I want to thank each and every one of you for the time that you put in. Uh, it's greatly appreciated by this person. Name and address. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. When you say Ray, oh, okay, you already know me. Ray Peabody, 370 Washington Road, our fair town. Um, again, thanks, and I appreciate the good work. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Councilor Pisner. I appreciate you bringing up the items you brought up last meeting, and especially with concern to our school safety. Thank you. Speaking of school safety, as you know, as a Board of Ed member, and just before I left, there was a plan to harden our schools. There was cost involved. I got into a heated debate with the former town manager about breaking up the cost of the hardening of each school so we wouldn't have to have a single contract and we could expedite that, the hardening happening. Did not happen, apparently. Secondly, we had, I believe, and I haven't found my notes from days gone by, there was a, there was a state grant to harden our schools. I think it was about $300,000. I'd like to know what happened to that money and where it went. Did it go into finishing off JFK, which is totally hardened? Or was it supposed to go to um, doing the, the lower schools, the elementary schools? I just don't know what happened, and maybe somebody could take a look at that. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of money to sit there and to harden the schools, putting in the double entries and the cement pillar and uh, put spe uh, special ballistic film over the windows. And I believe that money was around $60,000. I might be wrong, but again, I haven't gone back to my old notes, and I just don't know. But I just want to put that out there. Um, that's really, I'm very disappointed that one plan that was presented by the Safety Committee did not get executed. A second plan by joint facilities to the Town Council did not get executed. I understand finding in 2017-18 budget, or maybe the 16-18 budget, Public schools were, were shorted by a little bit over $3 million and, uh, from the state, and the town council made the school system whole, which was really great. It was a solid business move as far as I'm concerned. But going back to the cost of the schools, um, I, I don't understand why it's not done. I mean, 2016 to now, 2022, that's a decent amount of time to get the work done. Even if we put, broke it up into more manageable pieces, we could have had them done. And in terms of what schools get done and announced to the public, use aliases. It could be the Bear School, the Eagle School, the Blue School, the Purple School, who cares? But just get the schools done. Tell, tell us, people, uh, our residents, that they are getting done. Um, th those are the things that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I do, again, want to thank you and appreciate the good work that you all do, and even some of the bad work that you do. Anyway, thanks, guys. Have a good night. Okay, thank you. Next. Good evening, council members. My name is Attorney Rachel Baird, and I am the attorney that the Board of Assessment Appeals retained to answer questions about this independent review that's been the subject matter of the previous meeting and will, I suppose, be the subject matter uh, later on in this meeting. My office is in Rocky Hill at 2234 Silestine Highway. Just to begin with, uh, oh, sure, I'll, I'll sit a little closer. First of all, I am familiar with Attorney Talberg uh, in my professional capacity. I'm also familiar with the town manager. She, in her former role as the mayor of Bristol, when she was the mayor of Bristol, I did bring a federal lawsuit on behalf of a Bristol resident regarding an easement issue. They had attempted to work this out with the mayor when she was the councilwoman and then as the mayor. And then in 2018, the firm of Birch and Moses was hired to defend the city in that lawsuit, which is still ongoing. With regard to my 
retention by the Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, I have rendered an opinion to them about the retention of an attorney in this independent review, and I would just like to read the brief letter that I read to them because I think it's important um, for not only the council, which the council may also understand, even though it hasn't been brought up, but for the residents of Enfield to also understand. So the BAA asked me to render an opinion on the potential consequences of selecting an attorney to conduct the independent review of reevaluation issues discussed and tabled at the Enfield Town Council meeting on June 20th, 2022. The council, as well as the town's manager and attorney, focused on the council's role in the selection of an independent reviewer. While there was disagreement about the selection procedure, the discussion centered on the presumption that an attorney would conduct the review. One reason that municipalities choose attorneys to perform independent reviews, also referred to as independent investigations, is to provide a municipality the option of asserting attorney-client privilege when the public requests information related to the review. And I did earlier hear Attorney Talberg indicating that the report hopefully would be made available. I, I don't know why the word hopefully was used, but certainly this ability of the town to assert an attorney-client privilege does give the town the opportunity to limit what is disclosed to the public through the Freedom of Information Act. Again, this allows the municipality to selectively choose the information that will be released to the public. Enfield's residents should be made aware that the retention of an attorney to conduct the independent review may result in a lack of transparency into the process, findings, and conclusions of the review. And this is the opinion that I gave to the BAA, although it's not their decision, certainly, um, of whom to retain or, or whether or not to retain an attorney. But in my opinion, if an attorney is retained, the town should waive any attorney-client privilege regarding all aspects of the attorney's independent review. Furthermore, the town should find in advance of the independent review that the public interest in disclosing preliminary drafts or notes related to the review, whether conducted by an attorney or not, outweighs the public interest in withholding the drafts or notes. With these assurances, the town residents will have less reason to question or doubt the fairness, accuracy, findings, and conclusions of the independent review. And this, opin this opinion arises from my direct experience in dealing with towns who have retained attorneys to conduct investigations or independent reviews. They will record interviews, they will take notes, and then they will claim that all this is privileged, attorney-client privileged, and they'll refuse to turn it over to the town's residents, to the council perhaps. I mean, you're, you're not the one that's retaining the attorney, I, I suppose. But if an attorney is retained, and, and again, I'm not quite sure why the focus is so much on retaining an attorney. I mean, attorneys can be specialists in certain areas. Um, under the rules of professional conduct, there are, I think, 11 or 12 areas where they can be deemed specialists in certain areas. And, and I don't know if this attorney has been deemed a specialist. But certainly, as an expert in court, uh, an attorney, simply because they practice in a certain area of law, isn't deemed an expert. I mean, they could be an expert, that, but that would be entirely outside the realm of, of being an attorney. Um, so I guess I wanted to bring two things to this council's attention. First, the consequences of hiring an attorney and sort of foreseeing what might happen and guarding against it by saying no attorney-client privilege. And the second, uh, ensuring that any Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak.
We good to go? Okay. Um, good evening, Town Council. Thank you for taking time for me to voice my concern. My name is Robert Nelson, and I live at 24 South Maple Street, next to the Powder Hollow entrance of the Scanic River. Uh, my goal here today is to have our town, maybe in coordination with the DEP, enforce the rules that are already in place but are not being followed down at the Scanic River by the Powder Hollow entrance. At the Scanic River, on the weekends, we have seen a large number of visitors, mostly from Western Mass, come and essentially party at the river. I don't have an issue with anyone having a good time or enjoying the park, but myself and some of our neighbors have some serious concerns on the safety for the local citizens, the local police, the visitors themselves, and the effects on the environment. This park has seven parking spots which are quickly filled every weekend. There have been parking signs placed around the neighboring streets, but, have, but people are finding ways around this. Just yesterday, at the baseball field at the end of Dust House Road, there was 35 to 40 vehicles parked. There are signs on the parking lot which clearly state parking is for baseball events only, and all others will be towed at the owner's expense. However, there was not one person playing on the field yesterday. These cars are filled with people on their, uh, in their day's worth of food, drinks, cooking supplies, and giant speakers which are paraded down Dust House Road if they're not unloaded at the parking entrance beforehand. Dust House Rose has been treated like a loading and unloading zone recently. At other state and local parks, when water is involved, parks are closed once they reach their capacity. Not one person has been turned away from this park, and I counted over 125 people at this site yesterday, which is a common occurrence on the weekends. So I have four main concerns. One is also the safety to the visitors. There are signs that clearly state no swimming, no alcohol, no fires. These are all good rules and each have a reason why they are in place. However, none of these are being followed and none of these are being enforced. As you know, um, the river rock can be slippery and the rapids can be dangerous, which is the reason why there's no swimming signs. When you add, add 125 plus people to this equation, this can be an accident waiting to happen. Also adding to this is that there's no lifeguard on duty or no safety measures uh, in place. Then there is also a lot of alcohol being consumed as I constantly find glass bottles and other alcohol containers by the river along the walking paths and along the sides of Dust House Road. It doesn't take much for a broken bottle in the water, someone to be drinking too much or an accident to happen and you have a, a, a serious situation. I went down to the river this morning and I found seven areas where ground fires with coals were um, put out from this past weekend. Many of these fires were near leaves and brush that can easily catch fire. This is an obvious issue itself that needs to be prevented, especially if it's going to be a, a drier season. Two, I'm concerned for the local businesses and neighbors who live nearby. There is traffic that is now constant on the weekends with cars flying down Dust House Road. People are consuming alcohol and constantly littering. I personally don't feel comfortable allowing my two young daughters in the backyard when cars are flying up and down the road and groups of people are partying and constantly walking by. This road was not meant for this type of traffic and it's out of control. My third concern is I'm also con concerned for the police officers that have been trying their best with the direction they have been given. At this time, there's only one police officer in charge of managing and monitoring this large group. Like I said before, I counted over 125 people that were all out at the same time. How can one officer possibly control a large group should an altercation arise? I'm concerned for their safety. My fourth concern is the park and the environment. The amount of garbage left on the site and that litters, litters the roadway is the concern that I have. I have picked up dirty diapers, clothes, bottles, and debris of all kind on my side yard. I also worry about what gets left in the water and the damage it's doing to our beautiful Scanic River. Two years ago, during the Scanic cleanup, we found a commode that was, been, that was being used up the river. So my first request is that the park be truly closed when it reaches capacity, and that those looking to walk in be turned away. No one has been turned away to date. There are signs posted no matter which way you try to enter, and the parks, uh, no matter which way you go in, it says park closed, no walk-ins available. My second request is that we monitor or close the baseball field when there aren't any games going on. I believe there's a gate uh, lot, lot entrance that could be easily closed, and we can tow or ticket those that are parked there illegally. These two small things will make it much safer for the community and those that want to actually enjoy the park. If we can not for some reason close the park when it's at lot capacity, then I'd like to see the rules enforced of no fires, no alcohol, no swimming, no littering. Um, there has to be a message sent that this is an amusement park and rules need to be followed for everyone's safety. 
Um, I would also like to note that when the state took over this park, okay, thank you. Ellen Martin, Six Patricia Circle. I wasn't paying too much attention when our house reval came in as the mill rate wasn't established at that time, so I couldn't really tell how the increase in value was going to affect our bill. But when our tax, tax bills for our motor vehicles arrived, I was shocked. I had no notice of the assessment change, at least with our house, we were notified. I have a 1982 registered homemade trailer that we use a few times a year. Since 2011, the trailer was assessed at $100. We have done nothing to it to change its value. 2021, this trailer is now assessed at $350, an increase of 250 bucks. Don't understand why, have no explanation. I have a 1998 Volkswagen New Beetle with over 195,000 miles on it. It's good condition, some repairable cosmetic defects, but it's maintained with no major problems. That went from $890 to $1,450. Shocked. This may sound like small potatoes in the town picture, but those small potatoes of all the residents, and I've been talking to a few with older vehicles, and they said, you know, I never really checked. I said, well, check your assessment. Because to me, that's way high. Personally, I really don't understand the logic on it. I didn't understand the logic with a lot of the assessment changes with all the 490 issues. First, the 490 issues. Now we're into individual taxpayers. What truly bothers me is, the, is what is done without notification. The only notification I received that this was happening to my cars was in the form of a bill. So I'm saying, where's the concern for the taxpayer? That's a large increase on both those vehicles. I'm going to, a few counselors said it tonight. This is not the way government should treat its residents. The means is more important than the end. So I'm asking, have concern for the farmlands, our forests, our open spaces, and for the individuals who have older cars and vehicles and make it more transparent so that we are not shown a bill and that's what we know our value increased. Thank you. Uh, Dave Turner, 60 Post Office Road. Another issue on taxes. I got my motor vehicle tax. I had a vehicle here that's been assessed for $1,800. It's a 1948 farm truck. New assessment, 17800 I sent you the picture this morning. Did you see the picture? Okay, I sent one in. Okay, maybe I didn't have the right number this time. $17,800 for maybe an $800 truck. Another vehicle, 1997 Dodge pickup. Two years ago, valued at $3,500. Last year, valued at 56. I didn't say nothing. I didn't really pay any attention. This year is valued at 54. Book value is 3,500. So two years ago, they had a value at 3,500. Book value now is 3,500. Now he's trying to say it's $5,400. I got two trailers here, old trailers. They used to be valued at $100. Now one's $810, the other one's $350. But how can we go from $1,800 to $17,700 on a 1948 farm truck that looks like a 1948 farm <laughs> truck? So... And then I had other issues with, with the assessor's office. Um, back in the winter time, I owned 58 Post Office Road. Came to my attention, I'm being taxed on a neighbor's barn. I called the 
assessor's office, talk to the assessor. He laughed at me, told me to prove to him that it's not my property. So, thank you. Okay, th thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Can I come see you again? Well, after, after, after yeah. I just want to make sure I'm on your list again. Yeah. Okay. Come on up. <laughs> I'm Mrs. Francis Berry from 50 Long Hollow Road. Good evening, everyone. Um, okay. Mrs. Berry, 50 Long Hollow Road in Enfield. Um, I the issue is taxes. I received my motor vehicle tax bill, my property tax bill, and a third tax bill that I have no idea what it's about. I tried to call the town tax people to explain it to me, and nobody answered. Well, one the, the clerk who answers the phone put me to the tax people, but no one answered in that office. So, um, I don't know how I'm going to how to get in contact with them, so I, I'll know um, what the bill is for. Although it's due August, I did pay all my taxes that was due July 1st today. Just a little complaining, that's all. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that wants to come for the first time? Okay, second time. Yep. Would you like me to state my name and address again? Please. For the record. Please. And just to remind, three minutes, second round. I'm not even going to be that long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello again. Thank my name you. is George Hendrickson. I live at 26 Roy Street. Um, you know my story. I need to be perfectly clear. I, I don't think that I was clear the first time when I came up here. My problem is not paying taxes. I think that taxes are a necessary evil to keep our town running. My problem was the customer service that I received from the town assessor while I was paying my taxes. That was my that was my concern. So I want you to know that. So when you when you start to deal with the people that are paying taxes, know that George Henderson came here to tell you that the the customer service from the town assessor was really bad, and I didn't like it. Uh, my wife was very proud of me because the master sergeant didn't come out in me um, during that time. Um, she rarely passed me on the back. Um, she did that. She did on the 1st of July. So that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to be clear at where I'm at, and I'm off my soapbox once again. Y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. They know that email. <laughs> Ray P. Ray P. Body three seventy Washington Road, our fair town. Thanks, Bob, for that. <laughs> I have two points I wanted to make. First of all, I want to thank Mrs. Soul for coming up and bringing bringing the points that she brought up. I know from my experience in the board, it's very difficult for teachers to come up and speak to a board or to the town council. Um, old traditions that have gone where they're pressured not to, uh, I think we eliminated that a few years ago. Um, and I know Chris uh, doesn't have an issue with that. Uh, secondly, um, we may have gotten complacent in terms of school safety. We have armed police officers there now. We had armed guards before that do an ex a great job of not only protecting our children, but stepping in when things get a little rough uh, with a uh, parent and a teacher. Um, I had numerous comments, a, a number of comments rather, uh, in that regard. But one point I wanna make, in that complacency, an armed guard doesn't necessarily stop an active shooter. And I wanna remind everybody that in Columbine, the first casualty was that armed guard. Everybody seems to forget that. So those are the two comments. Again, thanks a lot, I appreciate your time. And good luck. <laughs> Karen LaPlante, 166 North Maple Street. 
Item two of concern, Scenic River Park. I'm glad somebody else brought it up because it's definitely summertime. Um, there's three signs that the stake park is closed and it says no walk-ins. They have to be flipped down, kind of like the stop signs you've seen that are closed when the traffic light is working and the officers can unlock it and open it up and drop it down as a manual stop sign when the traffic lights are out. Um, so whose job is it when the park reaches capacity? The beat cop or an extra duty cop? Who puts that sign down? It should be in writing so everybody knows. Let's communicate. An extra duty officer and cruiser is posted at the Scanic Rapids Park. We spent meeting after meeting talking with state reps, DEP, uh, police officers, trying to come up with a plan. And we thought we had the plan. All of a sudden, it doesn't seem to be being followed. Um, Enfield taxpayers are paying for this officer. If they're not there to enforce the simple rules, open at dawn and dusk, no alcohol, no campfires, no grills, no swimming, no carry or carry in and carry out your trash. Um, why is he there? Do we want him worrying about seven cars with possibly four people in them, 28 people? Or do we want him worrying about an additional 40 cars or more that are parked down the street with four or five people in them, another 200 people at that park, one officer? When you mix it with alcohol and people who don't necessarily understand what he might be saying because they speak a different language, that's a problem. Are the signs in Spanish also there? I don't believe they are. Um, why can't the beat cop handle the parking issues on Dust House Road, Powder Hill Road, Powder Ridge Road? Cars are to be towed. It says it right on the signs. They are parked all day, so I'm sure an officer on duty could find some time throughout the day to ticket and tow these vehicles. There, for, there were 46 cars at the ball field parking lot on Monday afternoon. Only eight were Connecticut, 32 were Massachusetts, and there were six from other states. Let's go the easy route. Don't let the officer on duty at the park even suggest there is additional parking down the street. The park is at capacity. The park is closed, period. This is a hiking and fishing park. It is not a rocky neck or a Hammonasset beach. This is also a dangerous place to allow swimming and I believe it is posted to swim at your own risk, yet it's not stopped. There was somebody injured there early on and I know he spent a, a time period in a coma. I don't know how he ended up, but that was quite a number of years ago. Um, on Monday, the park was at capacity, 7.30 in the morning. There were seven cars already parked there. Um, the officers that provide this extra duty on weekends at the park should have consistent rules to follow and should follow them consistently. Please, just uh, do something about okay, it. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to approach Council. Oh, no, thank you. No? All set? Okay. All right. Okay. Public communications are now closed. Thank you to everyone. Councilor Communications. Uh, Councilor Mangini. Thank you. First, I do want to thank Master Sergeant George, for your service to our country. And um, apologies if you were not treated with the utmost respect. And to all other veterans, I see a couple more out there, um, for your service to our country. Um, I had the honor of attending the Vietnam Veteran Awards as presented by our Lieutenant Governor, um, was it last week? Our mayor was there, a couple other council people. It was a two-day event, and it was done very um, professionally and very beautifully. And, and it was very um, proud time uh, for us in attendance and for all veterans to be honored. And I'm thankful that we were able to do that. Long overdue, but we were able to show our respect and appreciation. I also had the honor of attending the American Legion 76th anniversary banquet, which they hold every year. And 
Um, it was a very delightful evening, and I am just you know um, honored that they did invite council liaisons um, to attend. So I just wanted to uh, bring that forward, and to our our teacher, our teachers. You know, God bless you all. Um, you have a tremendous job, you know, to do caring, you know, for our children. And um, as far as, you know, looking at the public um, safety piece for our schools, I was going to ask this under um, special committees, but maybe through our mayor to our town manager, maybe she can maybe give an update as to when our next uh, public safety meeting might be. So thank you um, for speaking on behalf of our children and dedicating yourself and all of the other teachers that do a wonderful job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Pisner. Again, thank you everyone. Um, full disclosure, George is my neighbor. Um, he was doing a rant on Facebook, so I texted his wife and said, you tell George to come over and Marie will take care of him. Uh, <laughs> So I am happy it worked out. I'm glad you came down. I told you, get the appeal, um, make it right. So I'm glad that's happening for you. Um, Jessica Sewell, thank you again. Um, I will continue to keep you posted on that. As I said, that is something near and dear to my heart as well. I do think our schools need to be safe and we need to do what we can to make them all safe. Um, I too attended. Um, the uh, celebrate not the celebration, but the uh, uh, the veterans um, for the Vietnam vets, and it was a wonderful event. Um, I also had the pleasure of taking part in the Allied Resources Family Day, and I finished a 5K. I was very excited about that. Did really well. I made a lot of friends. Um, and for anybody who does not support Allied, I strongly recommend it. They have a great little store right near DMV, and it has the best bargains in the world. So everybody go down there. Also, um, I had the pleasure of sitting with um, the new director, and I'm going to mess his name up. It's Josue, and I'm not even going to try his last name, um, from the ER, ERFC. Um, it is not too early to think about the be be, uh, beginning before and after school program. So for any parent out there listening who thinks they're going to need that for this coming fall, it is not too soon. Um, I'm, I'm hearing the space is filling up. So by all means, do that. Um, Karen, thank you for coming up for the WPCA for the pipe. You, you know, I, I did some research myself, but boy, you're like a wealth of knowledge on that. Thank you so much. Um, and everyone else who came up, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's a lot to take out of your evening to come up here, but we need to hear from you. Um, so I appreciate you coming in. So thank you. Councilor Ludwig. Oh, you can go ahead. Sure. Well, through the mayor, I had a couple of questions. The DEP, I thought, for, I thought we had in writing with Sanic River between, I, thought, I think it was the chief and they, they had a commander who is responsible for Scanic? I know the commander from the DEP also has a beach. I know he, I know he has a huge eastern section of the state, but we should have all this in writing on how this works. Who, to the question, who puts the signs? They're actually supposed to go on whatever, social media, whatever else we do. We already should have that in writing. And I think it's with the chief. So I, there, there should be procedures in place that already take care of that. Just so, I don't know if maybe we just, it, the commander was actually before the council a year ago. I can't remember. I apologize. The individual's name. So I mean, we can just look and talk to the individual. We should be able to, you know, to answer some of those questions. Uh, speed bumps. I know. I know. It's but uh, interested in looking at some of the traffic oh, traffic calming. Maybe we'll call it that. More uh, is that gone anywhere? I, I don't know. I know we were looking at it about six seven months ago. But just curious for public safety if we could take a look at it. Like you know, again, Abbey Road, that section where there's been a couple major accidents. That was one of the sections we were kind of looking maybe do some traffic calming. I won't use the word speed bumps, but traffic calming. Um, rails to trails, where is that application and why is it getting held up? I, I, it's been a year since we voted on it and I know there was some, but just curious where it is, if we can get an update on where it is and if, if what's holding it up, yeah, you know, what, and just if we can get an update. Same thing with the human trafficking presentation. I know you've been busy, but again, very important, I think, to have that presentation for people in this town, especially when we have some training with some of our staff on it. I don't know where that is. And, and last, again, you know, uh, Mr. Hendrickson, I, I appreciate you stepping in. Again, I commend you for stepping in and helping them. 
but it goes kind of, I don't want to belabor the point because we're going to get to this the next in the agenda, but it goes to the, again, to the point, you're right, the burden was on the taxpayer, Mr. Hendrickson, to say where he wants his tax, but the fact that, again, we're making the assumption up front and putting him in that position is what we're talking about here. That should not be the case. And that's what we, it seems to continue to happen in different situations. The gentleman, Mr. Turner, I mean, if the burden's on the taxpayer, then that's fine. But we shouldn't say, oh, by the way, I'm going I'm to apply it to this. Then you come in and tell me it was the wrong way of doing it. Man, that's just the wrong way of doing business. Apologize that happened to you. And hopefully we, when we get to this item on the agenda in the next few minutes, we'll be able to set a course. Because, again, in my opinion, this is just not the way we should be doing business with our taxpayers. I mean, you're right. Everyone has to pay taxes. And, and, and I think my, my, my good friend, um, Mrs. Barry, as we talked about a few weeks ago, how many people just paid their taxes? Again, because Enfield pays their taxes. So Enfield pays its taxes. And yet, so how many people overpaid their taxes because they didn't look or they weren't, they're were afraid to say something? We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And that's what really scares me about this. And that's why we need to move forward, whatever we're going to do in the next, next conversation. And because um, this has to be resolved. Thank you. Councillor Desbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say to uh, Ms. Soule, thank you so much for continuing to push on this issue. Um, I wasn't here at last meeting, um, or else I would have said this then. Um, this town is very lucky to have teachers like you, and your kids are very lucky to have you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm new at this, so I'm not sure how this happens, but I think we do need a briefing. I think there is a uh, committee that is currently looking at these issues. I think. It is time for us to get a briefing on that and for you to get a timeline. Um, I think that it, we, it shouldn't be that hard to get teachers involved in whatever committee that is um, and to have them, you know, be communicating with that. I, I don't, I know we don't want to broadcast certain security things, but I don't think it's, it's beyond reason to, to have our teachers in the loop on that. And so you're absolutely right to keep pushing it um, and hopefully we can get that briefing ASAP. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Finger. Well, I agree with Councillor Despart. I think instead of spending money on a new splash pad, they should put the money into the school. You know, the, the security is, is very, very serious today. Look what just happened now. Not recently, you know, our flags are down to half mask. Um, and you're just watching a parade. I mean, it's just the world's falling apart, and it's a shame. Now, it doesn't take much to put those pillars in. It doesn't take much uh, to change door handles. You know, I, I think that maybe we should try to push more harder on that. Um, my apologies for not replying back to any of your stuff, but um, I don't know. I, I, I just think that it, it needs to be done. It needs to be done right away. It does. And you're not the only school. You know, you're not the only school. So that should be a priority before like i said any splash pads or anything else walkways things like, like that and for the scanic river if i remember mike uh Councilor Welwick was we had an officer down there and it was supposed to be a dep officer even though they may have been unarmed but they were still supposed to have somebody down there with them to handle the signs and the traffic there our guy was just there to make sure nothing got wrong if i remember correctly on that right, it's a state park. yep Right, and they're supposed to be there the next day to, to clean up the trash when our guys come up there and, and with our trucks and empty them. You know, we're not supposed to get out and clean them, but we're still doing it. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not, that's not part of the deal. So that's one thing about the Scanic River I do remember about. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think people are right to bring these concerns about school safety to the council. I really do appreciate it. You know, our country continues, continues to suffer from an epidemic of gun violence, and it is horrific to see this stuff, you know, every month. Um, so I, I look forward to getting briefing on what we're looking at in our own schools. And thank you for, for speaking up, Ms. Soul, uh, Ms. Value, uh, and Ms., um, or Mr. Peabody. Um, I also appreciate people just coming out and speaking. You know, this is democracy in action. And if people don't participate in their community in this way, you know, we're uh, significantly worse off for it. Um, lastly, uh, through the town, to the town attorney, through the mayor, um, I am kind of curious about um, the uh, uh, Ms. Corbin Sabinski's question about, I don't know if you have anything prepared on that, if you could speak to it. I'd, I'd love to speak to that, uh, Councilor Hopkins. Um, 
uh, to the chair of the Wetlands Commission, I'd like to know who you sent your request to, because it wasn't me. Uh, I pride myself on responding to all requests within 24 hours, whether it's an email or a call, I respond uh, within 24 hours all, at all times. Um, I can tell you this, the planning and zoning chair, for example, last week had an urgent matter about a recusal. The process is pursuant to chapter five, section one of the charter, upon written request, it goes through the town manager's office, usually through the planning staff, we will uh, issue an opinion. Uh, last week we had one roll in, I think on Wednesday, it needed to be turned around within 24 hours. Uh, as you well know, uh, my predecessor attorney, Maria Elzadin, the former town attorney, has a special expertise in land use. She handles most of the land use matters. And so last week, we ripped out an opinion for the PZ PZC chair within 48 hours. Um, I don't want the public to have the impression that our land use boards or the Wetlands Commission is without guidance. Uh, Ma'am, as you well know, there are two matters pending in which the Inland Wetlands Agency is a party, uh, being uh, represented by our office, Attorney Elsden in particular, and I can tell you for certain there was a site visit on one of those cases, April 13, 2022, less than three months ago. I assume you were there and Attorney Elsden was there and you could have asked any questions you wanted. Uh, prior to that, there was an executive session, December 7, 2021, in which uh, Attorney Elsden gave a presentation in executive session to the Inland Wetlands uh, Agency. And so um, I'm here, you're here. I'm happy as soon as we get through the next item on the agenda to go out in the hallway and uh, provide you whatever guidance you might need. Thank you. We all set? Okay, very good. Uh, Councilor Ungar. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Sewell and Ms. Mayhew for your comments regarding school safety. I'm all for that and I support that. And I don't know if, know if you know, my son's a teacher in Enfield Public Schools. So um, even if he wasn't, it, it's still an important issue to me. And I did speak with a special safety officer out of Windsor and I read him the list of your five suggestions and he thought he liked it, he thought it was good, but he had some other ideas and I'm not gonna say publicly um, how he wanted to add to that. So um, I hope to be speaking with him again, and um, we'll, we'll see what else he can contribute to this, and, and we can move along with it. Um, since uh, Ms. Mayhew and Ms. Davis brought up an issue about graduation, I would like to address that. Um, I'd like to say that two of the most exciting events that I enjoy every year is the high school graduation and the adult ed graduation. I don't think I've missed either one in, in probably 10 years. And this past graduation was wonderful. It was excellent, and I loved it. The kids were great. The speeches were wonderful. Um, and the rain held off. It was just a wonderful night, and I enjoyed it just as much as the other ones. Um, however, after graduation and before, different residents made comments to me. And being a council member, many times I'll call someone and ask questions. And at graduation, I did notice that there were three Board of Ed members that were excluded from the platform. And so I had called the chairwoman to merely ask her my concern, why were three people excluded? It was one Democrat and two Republicans that weren't up there to enjoy this wonderful event for our graduates. They work so hard and put in countless, countless hours throughout the whole year, and this is their one time to really enjoy the faces on those kids and to celebrate and just enjoy the evening with them. So I, I didn't really get an answer. I talked to the deputy superintendent and I was told that it was a leadership decision and my husband's involved with the leadership decision. He wasn't consulted on that and didn't know anything about it. Then I was told that perhaps the chairman would know. So I called the chairman and asked her, why were three people excluded? And she said that that was Enfield High's decision. And so while I had her on the phone, I said, I'll ask you a few more questions while I have you. And this is what some of the residents said to me. And I just relayed it. And um, I asked her about different people on the platform. And at that point, and no one's ever told me this in my entire life, that I need to calm down. <laughs> and I was told to calm down. And I was told, I don't like your tone. No one's ever said that to me in my entire life. 
And I was taken a little aback, and I actually had some concern for her that maybe she was misreading what I was saying. Next thing you know, I hear there's a blow up on social media, and that I said the graduation was terrible, and all this other nonsense. It's just nonsense. Um, I have the highest respect for our education system. I sat on the Board of Ed. I've actually been um, on the platform for seven graduations, and it's a joyful time. Um, I went and spoke with the principal at Enfield High, and she said it wasn't her responsibility. And so now I'm back to the superintendent, and I'm still waiting to get a call back from him. And I just wanted to know why were three people excluded. That's all. And it just morphed into this huge thing. And my approach with anybody, if I have a concern with them, I pick up the phone and I call them. I'm not going to call you about her and call him about you. I call the person directly and say, I heard this. Is it true? I was told this. Is this what you meant? And so I would appreciate that in return from other people, from residents. I, anybody that knows me pretty much knows that's how, that's how I roll. I try to be very sincere. I love this town. I love the residents. I love the graduation. I thought it was wonderful. And I just asked some questions that people asked of me, and I didn't have the answers to. So I just kind of want to put that to bed and just answer some of your concerns. And thank you for coming and asking me about it. I appreciate that. So thank you. OK. Any other counselor communications? All right, I have, I have a couple of things of, uh, to mention. First of all, um, the event that was held mon last Monday and Tuesday at Enfield High School in regard to the honoring of the Vietnam uh, veterans, which was sponsored by the state of Connecticut and Lieutenant Governor Susan Beisowitz and Commissioner Saadi, um, who put this program together. We honored... Uh, there was over 150 Vietnam veterans uh, Monday and Tuesday. And once again, to all the veterans that are out, that are watching and that are out there, thank you for your service and your resilience. The Vietnam War was a war in which, you know, many of the veterans, they were ignored when they came home. And this was a, a welcome back. We got a lot of, uh, I know I received quite a few emails from uh, veterans who were in attendance thanking uh, us for holding this event, and they were uh, they were quite touched, and it was a, an honor for them to uh, uh, to take part in this event. Uh, for the counselors that uh, attended, thank you. Uh, you know, for uh, Senator John Kissel, the state reps Carol Hall, and Tom Arnone. Um, you know, they were. Uh, in attendance on, on both days, but uh, for everybody that was involved in this ceremony, uh, a thank you to everybody. Uh, the next thing, um, and I know Councillor Pizzer mentioned that the Allied um, event that took place, the Allied uh, fundraiser for Special Olympic programs, this event is only going to get bigger and better as, as time goes on. Uh, there are a lot of different sponsors. In, in years past, the, the family day was just, you know, families that were, you know, involved with allied sports programs would, would walk the track. They would collect money. But this event is going to be uh, getting larger. Uh, there was a lot of sponsors that, that were out there. Uh, EFRC was uh, very big in this particular event, along with the network. Uh, so I would just want to say thank you to everybody that uh, donated to this special cause. Uh, I've been involved with this particular program for the past 22 years, and uh, it's something that is near and dear to me. And it was nice to see uh, people come out there. And yes, uh, Councillor Pizner did complete that 5K. And it was about, I don't know, about 110 degrees on the, on the track surface, but uh, it was completed. We, we definitely sweat together, you know, so, but it was a, it was a, it was a great event. Uh, I also did attend a CROG meeting this week, which dealt with waste management. One thing that we have to remember that waste disposal is getting more expensive as time goes on. The Hartford plant is going to be closing, and this uh, seminar... Uh, with the state, uh, we're talking about, you know, reducing ways of solid waste disposal 
and improving recycling efforts. And I think that's one thing that, that we will have to be really uh, transparent to the public is making uh, sure that, that we're improving our recycling efforts and our solid waste disposal. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Messaging and education is going to be uh, very, very important to all the uh, residents and being proactive in our efforts and waste and recycling programs that we do have in town. Uh, that's all that I have to, oh, one other thing I just wanna share with everybody, uh, and I mentioned that the last one, People Empowering People, uh, Monday, July 11th, uh, we are all invited to their uh, group project and graduation ceremony, which will be held right over here at Higgins Park at 5.30. So I just want you to put that into your calendars. That would be, that would be great. Uh, this particular group group has donated um, quite a few uh, dogwood trees that are right out in front here uh, by the uh, new walking path. And um, so we we thank Lorena Ceranos and her group uh, for all their efforts. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to move over to the town manager report and communications. Uh, thank you, Mayor. A couple of items of interest. Uh, for those of you who follow our social media page, we did put some interior photos of the Strand Up uh, last week, which sp spurred a whole bunch of interest from the community, a um, whole range of emotions as well. But one of the reasons that we try to focus on some of the projects and that one uh, we are waiting until july 12th to get the bids back on the um, remediation work that's going to be ne needed to be done pre-demolition which is the reason for the photos and why we were there but focusing on on some of those photos actually s makes people think about things and right now we are working with both the opera house players and the enfield historical society in terms of salvaging some of the pieces from within the strand that would be appropriate for both of those locations so uh, that's ongoing we have some concerns about how to do that how to do it safely what exactly uh, is within that inventory that could be useful how will we extricate it how will we uh, clean it and then who will store it and and what kind of change order that might look like in terms of that project. But I think it's important in terms of carrying on some of the, the history and traditions of that building into some existing buildings here for, for Thompsonville. Um, I did send an email earlier today with kind of a little synopsis of where we stand with some of our ARPA and CIP projects as it relates to the parking lots and the school roofs. Uh, Councilor Pisner had asked for some clarification on, on some of those funding sources. So if there's any additional questions, I can answer those. But I also wanted to let you know that in terms of the parking lots, uh, we have just been notified by Lorena Cisneros that there is a bond authorization grant that is available to Alliance districts that we are going to apply for that is due July 15th, which could actually bring additional reimbursement for those two specific parking lots at Hazardville and Enfield Street. Street school. If that, in fact, were to come to fruition and we were successful in that bond grant, and I think we would be because unlike many other communities, we fast-tracked those projects with some of those funds and they started before July 1st. Those projects are ongoing. We know what the costs are. We know what the parameters are. If that were to happen, I just want to plant the seed here is that we would have to again come back to the council with some additional transfers, but we would be returning a portion of the ARPA funds that were associated with one of those projects back to your pool, which means that there would potentially be additional ARPA funds that could be reallocated for some of the things that we've talked about tonight or other projects or, or frankly anything that comes up in the course of the next year. So uh, that was uh, very good news because we had been promised that we would have access to funding, but we weren't quite sure what that meant. Now we know the first round has come up due July 15th. Uh, I also want to make note that we are working with a couple of different departments to try to bolster and lay the groundwork for some of the town's marketing efforts, uh, community promotions, how we're branded, how we uh, attract audiences, both from the people who live and work here, but also the external audiences of the people who live and work 
around Enfield to bring them in for certain things. Uh, we did do a board that was produced in house by our public work staff, and we had that out at the farmers market this past Sunday, advertising the full schedule for the Fourth of July celebration, so that people would get a glimpse of everything that's being offered on that three-day extravaganza, and hopefully spur their interest in attending that. We're going to be looking for additional ideas as well in terms of uh, community newsletters, other types of digital promotions to get the word out about what Enfield has. Um, there's also, I've sent out an email, we are looking to schedule a leisure services subcommittee meeting. Uh, that is going to entail disc golf ideas, uh, an update on Higgins Park. Uh, there is a grant opportunity that Allison Aberghini has identified through the Recreation Division, and there's some updates regarding some actions with pickleball that needs the council's attention. I've also asked for a public safety committee, and I've emailed those members to know that they are on that panel, but now I would need some clarification from the council in terms of the school security issues. We met a couple of weeks ago in executive session uh, with the public safety joint committee, but we also do have one that is a subgroup of this town council. So I'll just need some directions as to which one you'd like these issues pointed to. Um, we are also looking to have another public works committee meeting that will need to be scheduled. Uh, and specifically, that is going to have to start dealing with the Water Pollution Control Authority issue. Uh, the town attorney's office has created the framework of what we think we want, and now we have to actually put some bumpers on that and decide what the next step is in terms of drafting what that looks like. So uh, it would be uh, greatly appreciated if those of you on those specific subcommittees could send me your availability and we could schedule those almost immediately. Um, you know, it is funny, there's been a lot of talk of, of Bristol tonight, but in terms of the Scantic Park, uh, Chief Fox did warn me that this is going to be my first Scantic Park summer, uh, and all that incorporates. Um, we have a very similar issue in my hometown, and we employed some strategies that actually did work. So, but before we do that, I would like to speak with Mr. Nelson and some of the other neighbors, because I think that there are critical stakeholders in terms of whether the strategies that do seem to work with large crowds and small spaces, as well as activities that are not encouraged in those natural environments, um, are something that the neighbors are gonna be on board with. So I will look to schedule something um, this before Friday to see if we can get both DEP involvement, and I will look up that opinion. I, I know the chief referenced it as well in our um, conversation, and get something back to you by Friday. The, um, the human trafficking, Councillor Ludwig, we did have that tentatively scheduled for June 20th meeting, but unfortunately, uh, the parameters in which she developed the program would have been over an hour presentation, and we didn't feel that that was appropriate because there were so many other things. So we asked her to tailor it so that it would be appropriate for the town council in a time frame that we could accommodate. Traffic calming would probably also go to public safety. It would, yeah. And uh, I think those are the four things that you mentioned. Rails, trails, I do have an update on that, and I thought that I had brought that to a previous meeting, but I will get that out. There's uh, various issues associated with that, and we did get feedback from the state, so I can update you on that. I just don't have it at my fingertips right now. And in terms of you know moving on to the next item, I think that you've heard from a lot of the public and affected parties tonight, and as much as I understand the desire to control a process, I really do think that it's time to move on this. You don't want to delay the activity in terms of a, a review of what's been happening. Um, we've implemented best practices with, with a lot in the assessor's office. You have funded an additional position to help with the short staff nature of it. Always room for improvement, but until we have somebody from the outside looking in, um, I really think that this is going to continue to dominate this board. So we are completely on board to do the process how you um, how you decide to do it. I do believe that there should be transparency and I would like to see a report made available because that's the only way that we're gonna learn and the public is gonna learn. But as you can see, even from the issues tonight, there's a lot of layers to all of this. There's a very technical nature of material here and I think that it's critical that we move quickly, especially before the September hearing process so that everybody understands where we're going, where we've been, and what we need to do to get better. Thank you. Okay, th thank you. Excuse me, Councillor Finger. Yeah, through the mayor to you. The ARPA money, if we get any back, is that um, eligible for the school safety that were that was being brought up? Is that can, can that be part of it? I'm not sure what the guidelines are on that. 
Um, the way that we've structured structured our ARPA distribution, Councilor Finger, it would be an eligible expense. We're also monitoring some other ARPA funded projects where some of the bids have come in under what we expected them to be. So we are not in a position yet to tell you how much money is going to be returned to that pool. Right now you still have about $519,000 that have not been allocated. Uh, Actually, that brings up a good point. I should have informed the council, too, that the Economic Development Commission is having their meetings in order to create the parameters for the Small Business Assistance Program. So that is going very well. They had a very productive meeting. I think it was two weeks ago, Councilor Santanella? Last week. Seems like two weeks ago. Um, and so that is going to be coming back to you as well, whereas they're going to be putting out that the parameters, again, of what that's going to look like, the town council will definitely have the opportunity to weigh in on that and, and hopefully be advocates for getting that money out into our business community for those groups that have uh, really needed it through COVID as well as have had some really creative ways of dealing with their business impacts over the course of the last two years. Uh, the last item that I was going to bring up just walked out of the room, so All right. I'll deal with that later. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Councillor Ludwig. Real quick, so the parking lot at Enfield Street, um, there's the parade, if it's not accessible for Saturday, we'll make sure that it won't be, meaning folks won't be able to pull in there. I, you know, there'll be enough, if it's not accessible, if it is fine, but if it's not, we're gonna need barriers because I know people are gonna pull in there and park because that's where the parade starts. So just a heads up, if it's not accessible, we gotta make sure that you know people can't get in there. We will check with the public works director tomorrow when we meet with him on our one-on-one, -on -one, but it is my understanding that that project is going very fairly quickly. Mayor Crisati, is the binder coat down? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, um, that's what I thought. As a matter of fact, they are putting in the um, the drains. Catch basins. Right, the catch basins right now. Okay. Yes. So, and they're moving right along with this project. And, I, bought, and again, I, I could have missed that. I got this in my tax bill. So I'm just curious, when did we approve the funding for this? And, and, and just in future reference, anything goes out, I would appreciate seeing the specs if we can. I, and if you sent them, I apologize. But again, I don't remember seeing this, and a lot of folks got this in their tax bill, mm -hmm. which is fine. But I don't remember allocating the money for it. And if we did, just please correct me, and, and that's fine. And then and the last thing, the so Mr. Riley, and you mentioned it with the Strand, I hope, I, again, I don't know what the current situation is, but I hope we try to dis at least work with the person individually. Answer if you go question. and look where that, his property line is, again, for me, so that the end, pro I mean, it's the demolition I'm more worried about because that's taxpayer money, and his property is right on our line. And man, I, I mean, with the anger that he had, let's maybe throw some honey to catch some bees because I, I know that the company we're going to hire is going to do a great job, but I mean, this is right on his property line. I'm nervous. That's all I'm saying. Sure. So yeah. I'll let Attorney Talberg answer that. But the yeah. question regarding the informational brochure to taxpayers was funded out of the marketing community promotions line item within the town manager's office. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, if I may just chime in on that, uh, Councillor Ludwig. Mr. Riley uh, retained legal counsel. He called me Thursday, Friday. I called him back within an hour. We had a very productive conversation. The ball is in his court. He's going to be presenting us with some kind of a written proposal that I will be bringing to you at some point. We're going to work with him. Perfect. And, yes. Perfect. Because again, if you haven't seen that, it is right on his line and it's right on our line. And if there's not, if you don't understand risk, there's tons of risk for the town of Enfield. Yeah. There's a dialogue Thank between counsel. It. It's, it's under control. Thank you very yep. much. Yeah, thank you, Attorney Talberg, for that clarification. Thanks. Councilor Mangini. Thank you. Um, through our mayor to our town manager, Alan, when you say send uh, dates and times that are good uh, for these committees, are you looking at um, specific days of the week, times? So as far as public safety, I just send you an email saying these dates, these times. We were talking about this uh, right before the staff turnover in the office, that it would be helpful to know the general availability of the town council members. Okay. I know that some people, we've made little notes about um, work issues and these nights are better, these nights are not. We could keep track of that and we could schedule, but we have had situations where we've not had quorums and we've had people not able to attend, which is difficult in order My to keep rescheduling. My time is your time. <laughs> 
So but I will send you the email. When I send out those emails, I am looking for general availability so that we can schedule it and make sure that the staff is there to staff those committees appropriately. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, th thank you. Uh, reports of special committees. Are there any reports tonight? Councilor Mangini? Yes, the 4th of July committee is wrapping up and we're going to have a dynamic, dynamic celebration. We've not had a 4th of July celebration for two years due to COVID. And this year we're going to outdo everybody and everything and it's going to be wonderful. So everyone come on down to the green. Enjoy every part of it. The committees work very hard and we owe them a great big thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just briefly, we did meet uh, for a DPW meeting, myself, Councillor Finger, and Councillor Ludwig, on the 21st of last month, um, discussed some issues relating to the um, um, the Water Pollution Control Board as, as the town manager spoke, which I think is a great idea. Some, th uh, some issues were brought up regarding um, kind of miscellaneous pipe issues, and, and I think this uh, committee uh, which will hopefully be created before the end of the summer, uh, or at least a proposal before the end of the summer, will be able to set up to handle that, those kinds of issues, as well as monitoring the financial health of our water pollution control system, which is really, really important. And we just, we don't want $30 million expense to come out of nowhere. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you, thank you both for attending that. Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. All right, mo moving on to <clears throat> unfinished business, the discussion resolution request for a bid waiver to retain an independent review of the revaluation issues. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion to take remove this from the table? Motion. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala and a second from Councillor Mangini. All right. The <clears throat> okay, all in favor? Yeah. Uh, opposed? Okay, we'll have 10 in favor, none opposed. Okay. Resolution, waiving the bid requirements to retain the independent review of revaluation is issues, whereas the town council wishes to have an independent review conducted regarding various issues concerning the town's recent revaluation process, and whereas the town council wants the review to commence without delay, and whereas the town desires to retain the law firm of Urcha Moses PC to conduct this review. Now, therefore, be it further resolved in accordance with Chapter 5, Section 8, Paragraph D of the Enfield Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby determine that it is not in the best interest of the town to require competitive bidding and authorizes the town manager or her designee to sign a retainer agreement with Bertram Moses PC. They prepare June 17, 2022, prepared by the town attorney's office. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. And a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. All right. Well, I think we've had discussion, so we'll uh, move discussion on this. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Despard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say, um, I just want to reiterate what I said earlier is that, um, you know, even if we were to accept this law firm, I think it's so important that we have a written MOU, uh, you know, sort of defining the scope. Um, so I, I can't, in good, you know, I can't vote for this in favor of this without first having that with our questions and scope. So that's, that's just where I'm at. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll boil this down in my opinion. Um, I think that a majority of the council is looking for an independent investigation. I think there are good reasons for that. Um, I think moving forward today, we don't get an independent investigation. We get an independent review, which doesn't result in the questions that are floating out there necessarily being answered. And that's concerning to me. Um, the uh, I think last thing I would like to say here is that um, you know, if, if it's a concern of time, um, I, I, along with five other members, members of the council, sought to act proactively and have a special meeting last week to discuss these issues, to get it ready to go. 
uh, to have these questions ready to go in a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding to issue contemporaneously to any approval of the law firm so that it can be very clear to everybody uh, what questions we're asking, what we hope to answer. Because if we don't send that to a law firm, I think we are kind of really wasting our time. We're not going to get um, the specifics back, which to, will really help put this to bed. So I, I will likely be voting no here. Any other uh, councillor Ludwig? So, 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 so if we if we vote this down, we don't have a meeting till August, and then I guess if we go to bid in August, I mean now we're now we're into there's already the appeal is going to be set up in September, so now we're already into the next appeals process. I want everyone to be comfortable with this, and it's like if 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 you want an RFP, and that's what you feel is the transparent way, and that's what you want and you want to have this memorandum of understanding as part of the resolution, then we can't just vote this down tonight and then wait till August. I mean, then I'm sorry. I, it's my, listen, I, I hear everyone's concerns. I mean, the town attorney and I have disagreed on some issues, but I respect his opinion. You know, but I understand some of the other concerns with going, you know, with a no bid with this, with this lawsuit. So I'm torn. I'm torn here, but I, I personally don't want to wait till August because if we do, I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I think we've done the taxpayers a disservice. So it's not a few weeks. It's a month from now. Okay? It's a month from now. And then we have one meeting in August, folks. Okay? Okay, we don't have two. We have one. So then if we don't pass it in August, we're lucky if we get it started in September. Now all the folks who are upset with their car taxes are going to be appealing in September because that's the next appeal. So we got to start thinking about timelines and having solutions. If you don't want to take the recommendation of the attorney, Again, I want this to be transparent. I've been very clear from the beginning. I've been consistent since February calling for this. And I, again, I want to move forward. I don't want to wait two months from now because we can't find one attorney that everyone's comfortable with. So we got to figure it out tonight. So just don't vote it down because if you vote it down, this pretty much, in my opinion, loses its steam. And by the way, here we are in August, and the same people are going to come up before us and saying, hey, now I, my car is, someone else is going to see their car bill, and we're going to say, okay, well, we're going to need another month. I mean, at some point, there is some urgency. Okay, the urgency was in February. Okay, we, we missed it. So now here we are in, in July. And I got to admit, I'm, I, I'm struggling here because I want an independent investigation. Because I don't need to have a tax, I'd be a tax attorney to know something is amiss, okay? I know something is amiss, so I don't need to be an attorney. I'm an insurance guy, and I know when something's wrong in insurance, you know, I understand the risk, okay? And the risk for the Enfield Town Council is we are going to have no credibility if we do not do something tonight, whether you're for the independent review or you're, you want to do it with an RFP. Something has to be made here, or an amendment to be voted on, a date to be set for a special meeting. I don't want to because, again, once we're done tonight, everyone's going to go live their lives. And I know it's hard to get people together, even when it's not the summer. So I got to tell you, I'm a little bit frustrated now because I want to move this forward. And again, I commend the attorney who I disagree with on some issues, who went out, listened to my, say, hey, look, we need an independent review. I do respect him. But I also understand people's concerns. There's some conflict of interest here because I want everyone to be comfortable. But if we don't do something tonight, okay, a month from now, I don't want. I, I don't want to be like, hey, look, all the people are coming for us. Don't worry, we're going to figure. We're going to go on RFP in August. We'll be back here in September while you go peel your car taxes. And guess by the way, folks, you got to pay your car taxes up front, okay, before you appeal. Just want to let you know that. So uh, if you don't, you're in trouble. So we need to find a decision tonight, okay. And I don't want to hear. I'm going to vote it down and we do nothing. Okay. I need some solutions from other people who want an RFP. What do you want to do? Mr. Mayor, point uh, of order, as me. your town attorney, I, and if I may respond to a couple of those yeah, questions. Right okay. yes. So the thing about hiring a lawyer is that the client um, just defines the parameters. It's t to your point, Councillor Hopkins and Councillor Despard, if your concern is that you don't want to let the lawyer run amok or that the lawyer would direct this thing, you as the client want to direct it, we can accommodate that with this process. Now, it wouldn't technically be an MOU. That's the term you see in you know, union issues. It would be part of the retention agreement. And so the lawyer hasn't been hired yet, but if the council would vote to approve the bid waiver to authorize the retention of the lawyer, we would then fold into the retention agreement 
the scope of the assignment. I had sent you all a communication that outlined what I thought the appropriate scope was, but it had enough wiggle room to say, or such other matters as we may from time to time agree. I, I haven't seen your memo or your questions, Counselor Hopkins, but you're the client. You get to tell the lawyer what you want reviewed. Now, in his or her professional judgment, they might say, well, let, let's talk about that. But at the end of the day, the client is the one that needs to be made happy. So that, that can be accomplished. It can be accomplished tonight. Um, with regard to, um, uh, well, th I think that answers the f first questions that are on the floor. There may be others, but. Correct. Th thank you. Councilor Finger. So the questions that you haven't seen yet, that was brought forward to, to us. All right. Couldn't. You said that now we would kind of like direct that firm with the questions that we'd want to see mm -hmm. go in there if you know if everybody's agreeable to it. So these questions that were that we came with is not just going to get, shall I say, uh, blown out the window and lost. No, no, counselor. What a lawyer wants to do most importantly is keep the client happy. And so you're the client. The town has a problem now. We've got, you, you, I don't have to regurgitate what, what the issue is. There are myriad issues. The trick is to finding a way to, to, to get it into a, a coherent form where it can be presented in an orderly format. Here are the undisputed facts. Here's what happened. Here's the law. Here's the application of the law to the facts. And what I fully anticipate, maybe I, I, should, I should have used better terms, I don't mean to say hopefully it will be published. Absolutely what needs to be the end product is a written report that goes up on the town website that says, here are the facts, here's the law. Now, the way a good independent review is conducted, the governor, uh, Governor Lamont just did one with regard to an issue that they had on the statewide level. Um, the state's largest firm came in, Day Pitney. They did like a 20 or 30 page report with the findings of fact and law. And it concluded with the, the final paragraph said, there are certain other issues that are not for public consumption because they involve uh, personnel issues or attorney client. That is being communicated in the more appropriate means. But I fully anticipate there would be a public document, bells and whistles, that describes what happened. And moreover, it would describe, and I would submit that you want to have recommendations for how to avoid it in the future and how to improve our processes. You can do that tonight. I've spent an incredible amount of time vetting this, getting it teed up. It's teed up for you to hit it and, and get rolling on this, or summer's going to get away from us. You can put it out to bid, and we'll be talking about this in the fall or the winter. Okay, so no, I lost my question. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Desvard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I think we should do something tonight. But this, again, I just want to reiterate, this is why we needed a special meeting last week. And six of us wanted a special meeting last week, and we were denied that. And that's a problem. And um, so, yes, I would be all for setting another special meeting right now so we can come up with these uh, questions that that need to, you know, it, it shouldn't be this way. We shouldn't be coming up with this right on the spot in a meeting like this. There should be some forethought to this um, and some coordination. And so uh, I would certainly be for uh, a special meeting. Uh, if I may respond, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, with, with all due respect, Dalbert. Counselor. Go ahead. Um, we can take whatever questions you have, and you could either do it through the liaisons that the mayor suggested or as the client. Uh, we made the lawyer available to you. At any point, any one of you counselors, I'm sure, can direct the attorney, these are questions I want answered. Councilor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and this is, I mean, this is the concern I have, just structurally. Uh, it's really important that we all feel comfortable that the questions are being answered here. I think it has to be um, a group effort. That's the council. We are the ones. Uh, we are the ones hiring this firm and doing this. But if it's if the setup is do an, an independent review and then only have the council communicate through liaisons that we don't even discuss before this has gone through, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I, I don't know, you know, if that's the intent here. I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion on it. But this stuff should be in writing before we go forward on it, just so there is no confusion uh, and nobody feels left out with it. Um, and that we can update constituents as they come forward. And, you know, this is not going to, 
the, the concern about this is not going to go away anytime soon. So I think it's really important to set a special meeting. I would love one next week. I think we can transfer a lot of the questions that have been raised here. I've tried to do a good job with writing them down so that they're, they're easily um, communicable to an a, a attorney looking at this issue. But we are we're just leaving a lot of things to chance if we, uh, if we just go forward right now. And I think that's the wrong way to go with this kind of issue. Councilor Bangini. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, with all due respect to my fellow council people, I'm not coming to a special meeting for this. We beat this thing up to death. And quite honestly, Nick, you know, you've done a lovely job with your uh, memo, um, MOU, mem memorandum, and, and that, that's good. What we have here is a resolution stating that we're going to waive the bid process. Now, with that, is there any reason why we can't uh, put language into this resolution stating uh, not specifics, but maybe to your point that uh, council people have an opportunity to question the attorney doing the investigation or something to that point? As Mike mentioned, we've got to move forward. We can't wait until September and then have this uh, process begin November, December. So what's it going to be? I mean, and, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is summertime, people aren't going to be able to get together. You're not going to have six people next week. Uh, I certainly am done with beating this thing up. We have a competent, uh, brilliant uh, town attorney who, who has gone to... Uh, you know, wit's end to prepare and research and accommodate everything we've asked for. I don't see why we can't come up with some language, um, you know, addressing a couple of council people's concerns. I really don't understand why we can't do that right now. Nine o'clock right now. Thank you. Councilor Finger. Uh, just for the record, I gave the town clerk the questions to be on file. Just let everybody know. Thank you. Thank Does you. The attorney have it? No. They've, no. 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 The town clerk does. Councilor Pisner. I think the thing that's not sitting with me is that we were left out of the loop other than being able to interview one attorney. It was never brought to leadership or to me that attorneys were being vetted. So I do feel like we were left out of the loop on that, just gonna say. I still say I just went through my notes, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, because I was kind of shocked when he said in the interview that he was having a vacation and that it would be 30 to 60 days because he had staff out too. So if that's true, then he's not gonna be able to start it right away. So maybe we should clarify that. I am all in favor of moving forward, but I, I feel a little unsettled that we are doing a bid waiver for an attorney. I would like to see an RFP go out. I would like to see more than one attorney, um, and I think we should be part of that process. I'm gonna stay with that opinion. Councilor Santanella. You know, I, I just, <clears throat> my, I'm gonna try to speak coherently and calmly. We have forgotten the people who sent us here. There is ego driving this discussion over who was notified of a meeting and who was available and who, this is nonsense. This is nonsense. Who was informed, who knew what, when? You know what, everybody knows everything that they need to know right now. Okay, right now, and the vote is now. So if you were upset about somebody not telling you something a month ago or a week ago or whatever, the, we asked them to work on a solution that, rightly so, Councillor Ludwig was adamant that we needed to do something about this. And, and, and God forbid, they went off and did their job and went out and looked for law firms. And now they're getting crucified. It's ridiculous. We've forgotten the people. We are here representing people who need us to make a decision. So come on, guys. 
this is, I have never been in a room, and I have been in boardrooms with egos that I cannot even tell you, and it's never gotten like this. Please, there are people who need us right now to make this decision. Thank you, Councillor Santanella. I just want to make a, one final comment. We've listened. We've all stated our opinion. Um, I think at this point in time, we do need to make a vote, and we have to move forward with this. M Mr. Yeah, Mayor, if ahead. I may, just point of order yeah, before you vote. I, yeah. I don't know if Councillor Hopkins had another. Yes. I, I mean, yeah. I just, I, you, yeah. you didn't see him. I, 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 I think perhaps well, yeah, yeah. you were on the stack first, Councillor Ungar. I would like to. Yeah. I'll come back. Councillor Ungar, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to add that um, I still stick to my original opinion that I said at the earlier meeting. Um, I do think we need to have an RFP and have more than one attorney to select from, and I would agree to a special meeting. Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, I think this, this uh, from I, it really boggles my mind. Um, about this. These concerns were raised back in February. We have still not been briefed on it. I do not know why. It's very frustrating because the council's role in this is to uh, investigate and provide oversight to departments and concerns that the public have. We are here for the people, 100 percent. And just to vote this through tonight, uh, I think, would be doing the public a disservice. We, we don't even know what questions we want the, the, the law firm to answer. We have a general subject matter area, but who decides that? It should be the council who is the client, and we should have met beforehand uh, to, to discuss that. It's crazy that we're doing this on the dais in a really haphazard, um, bickering kind of way. We could have met at a, at a special meeting last week. We could have had these discussions. We could have arrived at questions to make sure everybody has their questions answered. We could have gone forward with this. I don't know why that happened. I think it needs to happen now. Um, to to Councilor Mangini's point, uh, simply amending this uh, resolution is a little ugly. Uh, I don't know everyone's questions yet. Um, I have my own questions. I'd be happy to add those in there. But why not take a special meeting in the near future to discuss this as a group because we're a council, because we have the charter uh, duty to investigate, and we're the ones hiring the law firm? Why not do that, take the time with it, and then go forward with this? Ultimately, it sounds like there are six people who want a special investigation done and a real questions asked, not just a superficial independent review. Um, there may not be six for an RFP, and that's fine. But this is, this is getting really ugly. And I, my request here, if this is voted down, I would request a, and I'll do that separately, um, a special meeting in the nearest possible time to discuss this, to make uh, an MOU, uh, to make specific directions that we want that law firm that we hire to do. That would be my request here. Councilor Ludwig. Listen, I'm willing to compromise here. I, I am. I, everyone needs to be. This is a big deal. I mean, this is a big deal. This is something that, again, for me, again, again, it's my philosophy on government. I can't stand when the, in theory, the the, the bigger person or the more powerful person takes advantage. And I don't use the word take advantage, but has an impact on the folks who aren't as powerful. And and I'm not using that reference, but if if you want an RFP. Then instead of saying, where is town desires to retain the law firm, say the town desires to send out an RFP as soon as possible and set up a special meeting for July, blah, blah, blah. That should be the amendment. If that's what you want to do, it should be done here. Because, if again, if it gets voted down, uh, again, this, this stays till August. I'm more than willing, because I think this is so important, to do a special meeting if we have to, for everyone at least to be comfortable. I agree. I mean, I don't agree with some of the things that are being said of, again, because I think, again, Attorney Talberg, I, again, I respect his uh, opinion on this, but I also understand some other folks, why they're feeling the way they're feeling. And if that's the case, then we need to have, put it in on the, as an amendment and, ha and go out to bid, and it's got to be specific. And then so, because, again, it's getting to a point now, if we keep having this conversation, it looks like we're stalling. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, and I know I know we're not, and I'm not saying we are, but it's getting to a point. And you're right. I think the one thing, no matter what we agree or disagree on, this is a council decision. So if it goes down six, four, five, six, whatever the numbers are, to start it doesn't look good. I mean, so again, I've been calling for this for a while. I'm willing again to go an RFP if that's going to make other people comfortable. Even though again, I respect Attorney Talberg's uh, recommendation, but it's got to be an amendment here. 
you know, that you want to go to bid right away and a special meeting on July, whatever the date is. So again, it's in, and if people can't show up, they can't show up. But so this doesn't drag on to August, and we're having the same argument going back and forth. And but I'm willing to do that. That's my compromise. Councilor Santanella. So, okay. To your point, what if we were to say that the those people who have questions or want input have to submit their questions by a date? So the amendment, instead of having another meeting, that counselors have until a week from today to submit their questions to be submitted to the attorney. If, if the because I'm getting the sense that it's less the firm than the input into the process. So if we agree that this is this firm is acceptable, but we have not had an opportunity to input into the process, then we give ourselves a week to then input into the process. And I don't know, Mr. Mayor, uh, through the merits of the town attorney, if that is. If I may respond, if I may respond, I, I, I think you're, you've, you've got it backwards. With all due respect, again, when a client hires a lawyer, um, there is not uh, a need uh, upon the retention to have a very specific uh, MOU about these are the things you're going to do. We provided this lawyer with a substantial amount of documents. We're talking like probably 50, 60 pages. He has an understanding. And I've told you, I don't want to control the narrative. I don't want to be accused by anyone that the scope of the inquiry we gave to this lawyer was too broad or too narrow. We welcome your input. It doesn't have to happen tonight. That's all I'm saying. There's absolutely no need to either amend the resolution or anything. I've told you, and it, you should accept that your questions can go directly to the lawyer. You don't even need to filter them through me, Councilor Hopkins. Lawyers will take your calls. I take your calls. Anybody who wants to reach out to me, I'm there. And so um, I, I, I think you're, you'll just be spinning your wheels, wasting your time if you come back and have a repeat of this next week to try to put something down on paper when you don't have to. Whether it's for an RFP or a direct re uh, retention, you don't have to do it that way. The lawyer is going to accommodate your requests and structure his work based on what you tell him as the client. At this point in time, I think we should have the vote. Sheila? Uh, I, don't know, I think you folks got to chime in. What are you going to do here? If you're going to make an amendment, then you need to make an amendment. Yeah. Okay, so all right, so I will make an amendment. Whereas the town desires retain a law firm, desires to go out to bid as, as instead of law firm of Beecham and Moses to conduct this review. So to to, uh, to go out to bid immediately and set up a special meeting. Someone give me a date that people can meet. Seven thirteen next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to pick a date here. So the 11th, the 11th, um, well, just do it Monday. If you can't, you know, Mondays are council meetings. Uh, Monday at 6 p.m., uh, 7 11, 6 p.m. Yep. So the, the town the said the town desires to retain a law firm of Beecham and Moses. The town desires to go out to bid for, for legal services to conduct a review and set a special meeting on 7 11 at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers. That's the amendment. That's the proposed amendment. Proposed so amendment, correct. Are you asking for a second and then we do comments? Yeah. All right, so you go do this. Second. Comment. Second by Councillor Pisner. You need all in favor. All in favor of the proposed any amendment. Any discussion on the motion? Councillor Pisner. Yeah. Oh, discussion. Any discussion. Discussion. Yeah. discussion. I have yes. discussion, yeah. 
Um, I think those amendments need to be separate. I think you need to do one amendment for an RFP, and then we'll vote on that, and then one amendment okay. for the special meeting, please. Fair. So if you so want to pick one, then so I think we should do that. You rescind your second. Rescind my second. I rescind my, uh, my uh, amendment. My fr well, first amendment, desire to go out to bid to conduct this review. Second. Now, is there Discussion. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I appreciate the effort of a friendly amendment. I don't consider it friendly at all. I consider it a slap in the face to our town attorney, our town staff, and to certain members of this council. I'm going to be voting against this. We have to put a stop to this. Um, we're here to serve the public, not ourselves, and what we are doing now is we're self-serving. It is wrong. As Attorney Talberg stated several times, whatever questions any one of us has can and should be directed to the attorney doing this investigation or research or whatever, the conduct the business here. And quite frankly, my opinion, uh, is that if we start getting too far into the weeds, we're going to expose ourselves to liability. Now, I am not an attorney, but I smell that coming down the pike. I'm voting against this. I think it's wrong, and I um, am also concerned about our town being exposed to liability. So I'm going against it. Uh, Deputy Mayor Scala. I'm not in favor of an RFP. I'm not in favor of an RFP, and we should be voting on the proposed uh, proposed resolution. Any other questions? All right, we will have to vote on the amendment. All in favor? Okay. How many? Raise your hands again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Against? Six, six, four. So now it's amended. I offer up a, a second amendment to have a special meeting next Monday, July 11th at 6 p.m. Second. After the word review. Discussion. Thanks. Deputy um, Mayor Scala. One, I don't think we should be setting a date unless we know that the town staff is available to be there because if you want a briefing or um, th we're going to need to make sure that they're available. So, and two, if we're going out to RFP, there's no need for a special meeting <laughs> because it's going to be another month, unfortunately, before we get anything back. So we can have this discussion at 6 o'clock or 5.30 before the next town council meeting at this point, unfortunately, because now we're going to be a month or two behind. And then it, that's, that's, it's just the way it is. Then withdraw the second. Withdraw. I withdraw the second amendment. Withdraw. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll Okay, we will vote on the resolution as amended. Okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Ludwig? Four. Councilor Mangini? Against. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Against. Councilor Ungeyer? Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala? Against. Mayor Crisati? Against. Councilor Despard. Four. Councilor Finger. Four. Councilor Hopkins. Four. That's six in favor and four against. Excuse me. Item 12, consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I want to make a motion to remove um, item one from the consent agenda. Uh, I believe that there's a typo. Um, it says, be it resolved uh, that the council does hereby amend town code 86204, and I believe it should read uh, the sewer usage adjustment policy. So that's 
friendly it's a, amendment? It's a friendly amendment, just to, if we could take that off and uh, I don't know if we want to just vote on the consent agenda with this one amendment. Okay. Do we have to have a second on a friendly amendment? Yeah, you do. Yes. Do we? Okay. So I'll second uh, that. Okay. Seconded by Councillor, uh, excuse me, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, questions? Yeah, sorry. Yes. Again, I'm, I'm not against it per se, but again, why isn't this under the Water Pollution Control Authority? And this, when you make an amendment, I'm sorry, it shouldn't be on a consent agenda. It should be a discussion item where we can understand what the amendment's going to do. And we can have questions from counselors who may or may just to understand the scope of it. I'm not against it. I'm against it being on a consent agenda, and it should be under the Water Pollution Control Authority. So we should have a separate meeting. And I'm sorry. I, again, I will abstain because, again, it should not be on a consent agenda. Sorry. And then um, and on the second, the tax relief. Again, what what is going to be the scope of this? We still haven't understood the scope of the, what the committee is going to do. You know, and I know we had it, we, we voted on it, but what, what are they going to do? What are they going to recommend? How long is it going to take? So, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to abstain because this one should be under the Water Pollution Control Authority. Okay, so uh, in regard to item one, um, all in favor of the amendment, raise your hand, please. Yay. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, against? Okay, seven, th uh, excuse me, six in favor, three against, one not present. Okay. Uh, item number two uh, the appointments for the Senior Tax Relief Committee. Uh, all in favor? Mr. Mayor. Can I Excuse me. That was just a vote on the amendment to correct the okay. typo. You still right. have to do the discussion or resolution uh, for consent agenda one, which has been removed from the consent agenda. So. All right. So the, the first one, the discussion resolution to amend the WPC dispute process by adding language to the sewer usage adjustment policy for the change of use. Okay. Can we? Okay. Can we have discussion on that or no? Are we we're leaving it on consent or because no, it's off. off? It is off. Okay. Came so off. I have some questions on it. Tell me when I can talk. Okay. Just go ahead, Councillor Pisner. Okay. So I agree too that that we should have a WPCA. I I have a lot of questions on this. Um, a lot of them, Karen actually clarified. Um, I think this literally will open up a Pandora's box of people coming forward to ask for the same consideration. Um, and although I, I love the idea that he's redoing the firehouse and, and trying to renovate Thompsonville, and I think that's great, um, I just think we need more clarification on it. Until I get more clarification as to is he living there, I mean, there's ways he can put in two different meters. Um, we have other businesses that are renovating as well that might want the same consideration. So I'm not prepared. I will abstain from this vote. I'm not prepared to vote on this. Any other discussion on this? Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just very briefly, um, I, I think that the Water Pollution Control Committee that's being formed is a great way to handle these things in the future. Um, I don't love, you know, specific little carve outs. I think this one, I'm okay with this one ultimately if it does revert when the bit, when it becomes a bit functioning as a business again, um, I am all for people who have concerns about the way they're being built um, to come to the town. And I think it can be handled through that commission. I think that's the best way to do it. They can make recommendations to the council and the council can then act on them. So that's my two cents. Okay. So. All right, so the, the resolution, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby amend the sewer usage adjustment policy and add a new section D, change in use. If a property is converted from a non-residential use to a primarily single family residential use, the base quarterly charge may be adjusted to reflect the residential use. Okay. So moved. Cons uh, Deputy Mayor Scala. Second. Uh, second, Councillor Santanella. Uh, Sorry, one more clarification. Yeah. When we make an amendment generally to any policy, do we, are we, should we have a public hearing before we do it? It's 
just for amendments to ordinances. This is a policy. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, roll call. Councilor Ludwig. Against. Councilor Mangini. Four. Four. Councilor Pisner. Against. Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Against. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. Councilor Despard. Four. Councilor Finger. Four. Councilor Hopkins. Four. That's seven in favor, three against. Okay, consent agenda number two, appointments for the Senior Tax Relief Committee. Um, all, <clears throat> any discussion on this? I know that we, we brought this up. Um, Councilor, Councilor Pisner? My only question is, is there going to be a town council or a liaison on this so that we kind of know what the format is? Because I'm kind of interested in knowing how this is going to get put together. Um, so I don't know if you've given that any thought. I think that would be up to the the town council, but I think it would be appropriate if someone was interested in doing so. Yeah, I, I think you know once this once this committee is formed, we should have a liaison. So right. we I mean, will. Ellen, you did send that. me an email and, and clarified it, so I do appreciate the response back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other discussion on this? Uh, all in all in favor? Yay. Okay. Uh, against. Okay, so it looks uh, ten, 10 in favor. Mr. Mayor, before we move on, uh, the appointments for Senior Tax Relief Committee do include Mr. T. Katz, who is here in the audience. Oh, yes. And there is, I think, something that we have yes. to say to him. Yeah, Mr. T. Katz, <laughs> this, this past week, uh, you were honored as one of the veterans in the Vietnam War. And we have your certificate and pin up here. If you'd like to come on up, we'll give it to you. Congratulations. Okay, moving right along. Appointments, town council appointed none. Uh, town manager appointed, council approved none. Uh, under D, P, and Z, commission appointed, council approved. Uh, there are none. Uh, the next uh, few items that we're going to be covering um, were covered by the town manager's report, but if there's any additional questions, we can uh, review them. Okay, item uh, E. Discussion resolution of request for the transfer of funds for the repair and resurfacing of the Enfield High School tennis courts, $23,000. Be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made from municipal facilities, furniture and fixtures, $7,000, DPW truck wash construction services, $16,000, to the tennis courts, construction services of $23,000. They prepared June 28, 2022, prepared by Donald Noons, Director, Department of Public Works. Uh, any discussion? Any? So moved. So, oh, so moved. Councilor Bangini. Second. Second. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, discussion? Councilor Ledwick. So, and again, I don't know if you could answer this question, but so how much was in the budget for the regular project? And so, what's the twenty? Is the twenty-three going to be a quick overview, and then there's going to be this because the schools, right, picked up this project in their budget, if I'm, if I'm yes. correct. Yes. Are so, we on the tennis correct. courts? Yeah. Yes. So, what is this going to do? And then, if so, I, I so if we're going to overlay, and then they're going to come in and reconstruct it. Just want to be clear on the process here, and um, you know, and again, I'm sorry, and maybe I know you're not going to have this answer, but for August, will John be able to give us fun? I mean. Again, I'm glad we have funds left over. I'm not questioning it, but we should get a, a amount like, hey, here's what we think. We made a lot of moves on budget where, where there's been surplus, which is fine, but usually I, we get some sort of report on what that surplus looks like, and then we and I and, and we I think we need it for August. There's nothing wrong. I know if it doesn't, it goes into the contingency. But again, I have to admit, I, not having a lot of detail on you know we we allocated money. What's the project? I'm assuming the school is going to reconstruct it, redo it. Mm -hmm. 
So why are we giving them another 20? And I'm okay with it, but why? So if we're just going to overlay it, Nothing. that's fine. But I think people just need to know we're spending 23 just to buy us a little time before the major project. So I, if, I don't know if you can answer those questions or if I'm sure. wrong. So it's, it's actually in order to maintain the charter. So the $600,000 that the school is doing is effective July 1st of the new fiscal year. Right. Yeah. So in order to not exceed the cap, we're putting in the $23,000 so that we can get it going. Um, so it's really that whole project is fully funded. It's just a matter of making sure that both appropriations are married together so that we have the full amount. Can you get the specs at some point, what the total project, what it's going to do. I mean, just some, even if it's a high level, what it's, you know, timeline, what's it going to do. Sure. Yeah, you know, just, again, it's 600 grand. I'd like to know exactly what's going on, my own opinion. And again, this will be a question for later on. You know, we get to the, the parking lot. So there's this, I know there's a specific board board account that, that you know their money flows into and, I, and I, i'm trying to remember how it works between the town it's a three ten, three ten account is that m money so there's a 600 grand already been moved or excuse me so it wouldn't have been moved from us because they're picking it up right so this this is staying in the, this is just i'm sorry a, a systematic this is staying within our budget even though they're going to use 600 grand in their budget correct Yes, uh, they actually sent us a check, a okay. paper check yep. that we deposited and are now appropriating so that, again, the funds are married so that the public works right. director can manage the projects. So, dumb quote, sorry, great, thank you, and I apologize. But so now if you have money in two separate accounts, right, will they marry into one account at some point? Yes, the okay. 310 non recurring but, thank uh, you. project Appreciate account. It. Sorry about that. Appreciate the explanation. Okay, Sheila, roll call, please. Councilor Ludwig? Four. Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Four. Councilor Ungeyer? Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Grisati? Four. Councilor Despard? Four. Councilor Finger? Four. Councilor Hopkins? Four. Ten in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Discussion resolution request for transfer of funds for the BOE share of the Eli Whitney School Roof Project, $72,450. Be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made from the grant-funded projects revenue miscellaneous revenue $72,450 to grant-funded projects Eli Whitney Roof Construction Services $72,450. Dollars date prepared June 28, 2022, prepared by John Wilcox, Director of Finance. So moved. Councillor Mangini, and the second. second. Uh, Councillor Santanella. Uh, question, uh, Councillor Mangini. Thank you. <clears throat> Through our mayor to our town manager, I'm under the belief that we do have the additional funds for the roof because mm -hmm. obviously. The seventy-two four fifty isn't going to cover the whole roof repair replacement. So, so we do have the money. Yes, the seventy-two thousand four fifty represents the board of ed contribution toward this project. We've received a state grant of one hundred thirty-four thousand five fifty, and the original allocation for this project from previous fiscal year was six hundred eighty-nine thousand. So the total project is 896. And it's in the process of being done now? It is. Both roofs are in process, as are both parking lots. Thank you so much. Sorry. Councilor Ludwig. Sorry, if you wouldn't mind just also letting folks know that we will apply for grants where, again, the state will reimburse us some of that money, which flows back into that fund. Mm -hmm. So, again, maybe we can help out on other roofs if they go, right? So Bless you. that's the other key point to this that people need to understand. Right. There is yeah. a lot of money that is flowing through the State Department right. of Education, and I do believe that Enfield is well positioned to grab some of that, i.e., the parking lot money that I referenced earlier. Thank you. Sheila, roll call, please. Councilor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Pisner. Four. Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. Councilor Despard. Four. Councilor Finger. Four. Councilor Hopkins. Four. That's ten in favor, none against, and no abstentions. G, discussion resolution request of transfer of funds for the BOE share of the Hazardville Memorial School Roof Project, $71,260. Be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made 
uh, from grant funded projects revenue miscellaneous revenue seventy one thousand two hundred sixty to grant funded projects has a real memorial roof construction services seventy one thousand two hundred sixty dollars they prepared june twenty eighth twenty twenty two prepared by john wilcox director of finance so moved councillor mangini second Second. Uh, Councillor Santanella. Okay. Any discussion? Sheila, roll call, please. Councillor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Pisner. Four. Councillor Santanella. Four. Councillor Ungayer. Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. Councillor Despard. Four. Councillor Finger. Four. Councillor Hopkins. Four. Ten in favor, none against, no abstentions. H, discussion resolution request of transfer of funds funds for the BOE share of the Henry Barnard School parking lot, $600,000. Be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8 of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made from CIP fund revenue, fiscal year 2021, miscellaneous revenue, 600000 to the school paving construction services of 600000 Date prepared June 28, 2022. Prepared by John Wilcox, Director of Finance. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. Second, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, Sorry. Questions, uh, Councilor Ludwig. Uh, and this, again, it's a procedural. Uh, so it's saying from the CIP fund of 20, 2021. The other three amendment adjustments came from the revenue fund. So why is it coming from the 20, 2021 CIP instead of the revenue fund, which what I asked, is this coming? It looks like it's coming from our budget, moving it from our CIP into a school funding. So I'm saying the way it's worded looks like it's actually not coming from the Board of Ed. It looks like it's coming from our CIP budget from 2021. And the way it's worded, that's the way I take it, unless I'm wrong. I'm not sure about that, but I do believe that that was a CIP project that was allocated to an education project, and that's why it's showing fiscal year 2021. But uh, Finance Director Wilcox is not in today or for the rest of the week, but I'll find out. All right. Appreciate it. Thank but you. But I believe it is education related, which is why it's showing that way. Thank this you. is another transfer in from the Board of Education. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. All yeah. set. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, roll call, please. Councilor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councillor Pisner. Four. Councillor Santanella. Four. Councillor Ungayer. Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. Councillor Despard. Four. Councillor Finger. Four. Councillor Hopkins. Four. Ten in favor, none against, no abstentions. Uh, discussion resolution request of transfer of funds for additional fire protection charges of $160,000. Um, this is uh, due to the pending litigation from last year. Uh, this, this item was under budgeted for the fiscal year ending June 30th. Uh, so there is a balance and the finance department is requesting this transfer to pay this and close the books for the fiscal year. So be it resolved that in accordance with chapter six, section eight F of the town charter, the following transfer is hereby made from the non-department pension and retirement charges, pension municipal employee, $160,000 to the non-departmental transfers out in contingency, water sewerage, $160,000, date prepared June 28, 2022, prepared by John Wilcox, Director of Finance. So moved. Councilor Mangini, second. second. Uh, Councilor Santanella. Uh, discussion? Uh, Sheila, roll call, please. Councilor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councillor Pisner. Four. Councillor Santanella. Four. Councillor Ungayer. Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. Councillor Despard. Four. Councillor Finger. Four. Councillor Hopkins. Four. Ten in favor, none against, no abstentions. J, discussion resolution request for transfer of funds for the Enfield Police for uh, for gas, 45000 This line item was over budgeted due to the increase in fuel cost. So be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8 of the Town Charter, the following transfer is hereby made from police services, health, medical insurance, $45,000 to police services for gasoline, $45,000. Date prepared June 28, 2022, prepared by Captain Jeff Jeffrey Golden. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. And Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Sheila, roll call. 
Councilor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Pisner. Four. Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. Councilor Despard. Four. Councilor Finger. Four. Councilor Hopkins. Four. Ten Sorry, in favor, four. none against, Sorry. no abstentions. Okay, uh, 12, any other business to come before us tonight? Uh, and 13, public communications. Um, this round here will be three minutes. Please state your name and address, please. Of course, Donna Corbett Zabinski, uh, 37 Barrett Road. I'm here as Inland Wetlands Chair. We had our discussion in the hallway, and there's obviously a roadblock in your in your staff. Our June 21st meeting minutes, we asked to have the attorney. He doesn't know anything about it. So <clears throat> we've asked many other times. I know Marie was on Inland Wetlands with us. I'm sure she probably remembers. We've asked many times, and we don't get the attorney. So there is definitely a roadblock somewhere along the line that the information is not getting to him that we want to talk to him. I have his card. I'm going to call him myself. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come in front of the council? Uh, Bob? Uh, about to cats, 815 Woodgate Circle. I want to thank you all for the applause. I, I don't deserve it. Uh, every year I go to the reassessment on my automobile in September, which is a mystery date because they don't even know when they're going to meet. You, you have to call a couple weeks before, and then they kind of, oh, it's, they're going to meet on uh, September 10th. They, they, should be able to, they should be able to tell you right now when they're going to meet. But there's... The, the automotive industry has certain standards on automobiles. So you can go to the library to see the reference department. You give them your, 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 your the year of the car, and the make, and the, and the model, the mileage, and they come up with the value of the car. And you use that when you get, go for the reassessment hearing. And uh, generally, I, I uh, lose about $7,000 because of the high mileage. I had a, a 2018 Hyundai Tucson with uh, 312,000 miles on it, and I got into an accident. A woman was driving down Enfield Street with no lights. The car was totaled. And uh, because of well, what happened in the auto industry, the car values are going up, even on used cars, tremendously, sometimes 40%. So my car, which was really worth seventeen thousand, was one, was valued at the insurance company at twenty nine thousand. So I thought I was just going to get away clean with no no money. Well, I got a check for five, almost five thousand. They deducted seven thousand for the mileage, so I would have got more. But you can people can do that, and if there's a problem with the paint on the car, they go to a body shop. How much would it cost to paint the car? You bring that into the assessment and say my my car's value is less than this because it's $3,000 for a paint job. Joe Bosco had a Corvette with had a salvage title, which made a big difference in the value of the car. It was about probably $10,000 difference in the value of the car. It was a rare car. So he had to go every year to get this reassessment. So people can do that, but they have to do some... You, it's, The owner has to do the work to get the value of the car and present the evidence at that meeting. But people don't, don't seem to want to do that. It takes work to get some money back. So that it's, up to, it's up to the owner of the automobile to do the work to get that done. It's not up to the assessor's office. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Okay. Karen LaPlante, 166 North Maple. Just to revisit the WPCA thing, um, there's two definitions that suggest customer type in your regulations. Residential and, s and small non-residential users, sewer users including single family and multifamily dwellings, and commercial and industrial users, which introduce no more than the equivalent of 25,000 gallons per day of domestic sanitary waste to the treatment works. That's 
2,250,000 gallons in a quarter. Unless this business is going to be brewing the beer and making the beer and having a heck of a business, he is still going to qualify as the same qualifications. He's not in a commercial zone. Whether the business, whether it was used in the past as the business, I can almost guarantee that fire district was not using that kind of water. So the, the, the industrial and commercial users are the ones that are over 25 gallons per day, 25,000 gallons per day. So by adding the word residential into whatever adjustment policy you have, I think you've done nothing. Because <laughs> It's based on meter size. Change the meter size. A two inch meter will not register slow flows. So you got a toilet that flushes a gallon and a half or two gallons. That meter's probably not even gonna move. So he's probably not even being charged for the gallons he's using because he's using such little gallons. So to be careful what you do when you make the adjustment or when you approve the adjustments because um, unfortunately the Finance department doesn't want to understand this problem either. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come forward? Okay, counselor communications are closed. Uh, public, communi excuse me. public communications are closed. Counselor communications. And then do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. And a second. second. To counselor Santanello. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Ten in favor. Meeting adjourned. Have a nice, have a good week. Take care.